There's no time. No. The time is... 13. O'clock. Hey, everybody. What's going on? I kind of feel like our camera moved again. What the fuck? Probably right? did. I don't know. I, I went in here. I didn't touch it. Okay. <laughs> I only just came over here. All right. Yeah. Who knows what's happening? I guess that's good. Who knows what's happening? Well, I wanted to get like that uh, that thing out of the uh, out of the frame. But yeah. So what's up, everybody? It's Wednesday night. It's our episode three hundred show. Episode three. Yes, yeah, Sabrina was thank it was, was uh, congratulating us for that. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, show three hundred, and uh, Jenny's got a good one for us today about this, some Australian dude. So, about some Australian dude. Yeah, she told me the name. I forgot. Probably the most famous Australian dude uh, of all time. Probably. I just kind of feel like well, this is one of the topics I remember. Like a lot of people recommended it a long time ago. And I remember putting it in the poll like a bunch of times, probably like last year sometimes, and it never won. But then somebody, um, one or two people like just a few weeks ago recommended it again. And I was like, oh yeah, we should probably do a show about that. So it won this time. So yeah, I'm kind of excited. So see, I didn't know a huge amount about Ned Kelly. I think I'd seen like one of the movies about him, <laughs> of the fuck ton of movies that have been made about him. Um, one of which had Mick Jagger in it. One of which had Heath Ledger in it. Uh, yeah, they've made, like, tons of movies about this dude, and, like, there's songs about him, there's books about him, there's just, I mean, it's just a ridiculous... I guess he's supposed to be kind of like a Billy the Kid kind of guy? Sort of, and it's kind of like, I feel like he's sort of, I don't know, uh, you know, because I've never been to Australia, but I do kind of feel like there is sort of, like... Some, I don't know if I'd call it controversy, but with a lot of people seeing him as sort of like a folk hero uh, in the vein of like Robin Hood or something like that, and then some people just saying, no, he was just like a criminal. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. there's that kind of thing as well. And I really don't know at this point if it's ever going to be sorted out because it was so long ago. This was the early 1900s? Ye no, 1800s. 1800s. Yeah, 1800s. Yeah, there was a lot of characters like that. Yeah. Most of your old West characters are kind of like that. Yeah. They're, they're criminals. They were <laughs> entertaining, though. Yeah. A lot of them. Depending depend on what the situation was. Some of them more complicated than others. I think a lot was made out of Billy the Kid. It really wasn't there. But uh, Jesse James, you know, yeah. bank robber. But there was more to him, too. A lot of people re read a lot into, into who he was. But he seems to have been kind of like... Confederate Special Forces. He was still evidently robbing banks to fund kind of like a resistance movement against the North, which that, that could be plausible. He was in, in the war, but nobody really knows. I, I, think, I think it's mostly, I think it's all legend at this point. Well, the thing about Ned Kelly is that they're pretty sure like what happened most of the time. It's just that a lot of times his version of events and the police's version of events are two different things. Yeah. And so you're never entirely sure, like, what to believe because, you know, maybe he was full of shit, but the police were kind of, like, not, were sort of, like, looked down upon yeah. in that time period as well, and maybe they were also making up some shit. Well, so, a lot of times the cops were also criminals in the 1800s. Yeah, and I think Ned kind of pointed out something like that, which I'll uh, get into in a bit. Yeah. But it's, yeah, it's, a really, it's, it's a really interesting uh, story. Yeah, because I was saying that Ned Kelly, I I, yeah, I don't know if Ned Kelly's like the most famous Australian, but he's for sure like one of the most famous Australians. Um, and John Smith said, Ned Kelly, I remember the movie in which he's played by Mick Jagger with an Irish accent. Yeah, well, his uh, family were Irish, so uh, that's why. But yeah, I think that movie came out in 1970. Mm. Wasn't the only movie about him. There was like a shit ton. But I think that was the only one that I've seen, and that was like a long time ago. Tyler, the guy, says, I think the most famous Australian is probably Steve Irwin. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Thank you, Zach. Steve Irwin has left the chat. Also, Ned's yeah. hood would make a good Halloween costume, because that shit is nightmare fuel. I was thinking that, but... When you see his outfit, it kind of looks like, from far away, I know it's made of metal and stuff, but from far away, it looks like the Zodiac. 
So I kind of feel like if you wore something like that nowadays, people would just say, are you like the robotic Zodiac? You're like, no, I'm Ned Kelly. And everybody would be like, who? They wouldn't know who that was. Like in the United States. But in Australia, they even have like big statues of the... Do you know how we have like Bob's Big Boy and stuff like that? They have big, huge Ned Kelly ones in his homemade body armor. Is it just the head? Or is it No, uh, it's... Yeah, it's head, front, and I think... Maybe the arms, although I think it went part... Yeah, it was, like, super, super heavy. He made it out of, like, plow things, like, that he stole. You know what I mean? Like, plow blades. And, uh, kind of worked, but we'll get into that. (laughs) Well, it was lead projectiles back then, and black powder. (laughs) Well, they had some, uh, smokeless powder, but it's usually black powder. And lead projectiles without any jacket on them. And the velocities were low. It's easy to stop that. You couldn't stop a modern bullet with that. It's got to be real hard. There are some steels that are very fucking hard, hard enough to do it. Or that it has to be soft enough to absorb it. One of the two, like a Kevlar. They're, they're coming out with fucking meta materials that'll probably work. But they'll be expensive, and it's not really... None of that shit's really, you know, having worn that kind of crap. None of, it's, none of it is practical for... Every, every military situation, you know. Well, it's the, fucking hot. The shit that he a, made. I mean, yeah. obviously, this was like the 1800s. But the shit yeah. that he made was very heavy, and also kind of impractical in the yeah. sense that you could still shoot with it on, but it was awkward. You know what I mean? Plus, um, he mostly just had, like I said, he had the helmet and the kind of the front part. And uh, he didn't really make anything for his legs, which would end up, like, uh, right, biting yeah. him in the ass. So, yeah, Danny Rowling says his childhood home is still preserved. Yep, that's right. Uh, yeah, armor made from metal plows. Honestly, there was a... Uh, thank you again, Zach. Whoa, I just Googled him. His hairdo is amazing, and his beard is glorious. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a smile you can pet. <laughs> oh, my God, that's why. The crazy thing, there's, a, like, a bunch of pictures of him, actually, and there was one picture of him, because I watched a bunch of documentaries about him yesterday and today. And there's one picture of him where he was supposed to be 15. And I was like, man, that's a hard 15. He looked like he was about 35 in yeah. that picture. But they said yeah. he was, like, 15. Like, yeah. I, don't, I don't know about that old, but he looked, like, much older than 15. Damn. I'm just saying. He didn't He didn't really look like a kid. But, yeah, it's, um, what was I going to I was going to say something about uh, his armor. But, oh, I was watching a documentary earlier, and it kind of showed... It's probably from a few years ago, I think, but it was an Australian-made documentary, and they showed kind of all the sites where shit had happened. And a lot of the stuff is still there, like that... And, you know, and obviously it's a big, huge tourist attraction. The sites where it happened, it's like not big, not big towns or anything, but... Uh, it's kind of a big tourist attraction. You go, they just call it Kelly Country, and you just kind of go and go to all the sites, and they have signs up, and it's like, this is where this siege happened, and this is where this, that, and the other thing happened. So it's apparently like a big tourist draw. You know, they have like thousands of people go there. And Camp Guy said, I want to get a pretty boy, poof, poof, pompadour, like <laughs> Anthony Michael Hall and Pretty and Pink. What? <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. Was Anthony Michael Hall and Pretty and Pink? Mm. He was in Breakfast Club. Yeah. And he was in... Weird Science. No. Oh, no, he was in Pretty in Pink, wasn't he? I thought he was in Weird Science, too. He was in Weird Science. He yeah. was in all the... He was in... Yeah. And he was in Breakfast Club. Yeah, he was in Pretty in Pink. That's right. He was? He was the one that um that wanted... That got uh, Molly Ringwald's panties. Okay. That's right. I haven't seen that Somebody movie. started to get kind of studly? No. Okay. He didn't really get studly until um, Edward Scissorhands. Edward Scissorhands, yeah. Because I feel like he was in all the John Hughes movies in the 80s. Yeah. He was, you know, a skinny geek. He always played a skinny geek. But then everybody was shocked when Edward Scissorhands came out, and he was, like, suddenly all buff and studly like a jock, and everybody's like, holy shit, that's Anthony Michael Hall? He uh, filled out, didn't he? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, he's good in the Dead Zone series. Yeah, and he would—he was in the new, uh, the newest Halloween movie. As yeah, well. he was. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the Dead Zone series, man. He was—he um, was a lady killer, man. Fucking, he was studly. Mm-hmm. Studly, <laughs> that's 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 kind of like his, his some of his best work being on that series, if you ask me, because it's so so much of it. That's such a yeah. That's a good yeah. show. That's a good show. Yeah, Tammy's laughing at uh, <laughs> sex. A smile you can pet. Yeah, I've never heard that before, but that's like a really funny. I've never seen a guy. 
You never saw a picture mm. of him? You should, oh, well, you probably can't Google him right yeah, now. Yeah, well, but, I have to stop the stream. Uh, yeah, you'd have to stop the stream. Yeah, he's, uh, it's quite a beard he's got, yeah. like, toward the end. I mean, yeah, it wasn't Pretty in Pink. Oh, yeah, that's right. It was uh, 16 Candles. That's right. I got those two confused. Yeah, Anthony, yeah, that's what I, okay, so I was right the first time. Anthony Michael Hall wasn't in Pretty in Pink. Yeah, he was, I don't in, he was in 16 remember. Candles. Okay. He was in 16 Candles. That was the, uh, that was the one he was in. Uh, yeah, he got thick, yeah. Um... John Cusack was in one of them. Uh, yeah, I think that was Sixteen Candles. Also, he was in it for like a minute. He was one of the one of the dorky, one of Anthony Michael Hall's like dorky friends. Well, I would That's imagine what, what happened is I can think about it. He got stereotyped from those roles. Yeah, and he probably fucking got sick of people treating him like those characters he was playing. He's like, fuck this shit. So he goes on cycle and goes to the gym because fucking that didn't look natural to me. He he got big. I mean, just was, like just like in the back of the comic books, like the ninety eight yeah, pound weekly yeah, when the guys yeah. like kick their sand that was in Joe Weider in the beach. No, not Joe Weider. Who was at the uh, Charles Atlas? Yeah, that was that Charles Atlas ad. He got sued for that because <laughs> it made un- unrealistic claims. Yeah. yeah, which is funny because I always thought like ads making unrealistic claims. I mean, I thought yeah. you could get away with that until fairly recently. Uh, he was selling something. I forgot what it was. It was just a training program, and I think some of it involved... Oh, it was all... Um, um, okay, Jenny's sending me down a rabbit hole. Oh, no. Fucking um, Charles Atlas, in the ad, claimed that he built his body using this technique that he had, muscle versus muscle, okay? Where you fucking... Basically, what they're talking about, he was... T- basically, what it was is sit-ups, push-ups, pull-ups, dips... But then, like, I, I forgot what it was. Trying to do curls against one arm, that, that really doesn't work. All right. But he claimed that he built his body that way. He didn't. He built his body fucking lifting weights and taking steroids. You know what I mean? So you, he, he could sell his training thing. He just, the problem was is that he claimed that he used that training method to build his body. And, and they made him take that. Yeah, that's down. there's very specific right. claims you make in advertising. Like, yeah. you, there's ways around it. Like, there's right. weasel words and stuff, yeah. but you can't. And something I didn't even realize, I was reading an article the other day just about something else, and it kind of brought this up. But they were saying, you know how back in the old days you always heard, the old, like, the old thing? It's like, oh, you know, we do these commercials with, um, you know, hamburgers or cereal or whatever, and they use... Uh, things that aren't food like to make it look better on camera like we use glue instead of milk like in cereal commercials and shit like that well um for a long time i guess that was true but recently they're like if you sell or if you're selling food like in an advertisement it doesn't matter just gonna print advertisement web or anything that has to be the actual food yeah. there has to be a picture i mean you can tart it up obviously and photoshop it and stuff like that but it actually does have to be the food that you're selling which i didn't realize i thought you could just like put whatever bullshit on there as long as it kind of resembled <laughs> like what they're selling you but apparently it does have to be actual food yeah you know in the case of atlas i don't think he had to pay anything i think he just had to change his he went he got sued and had to change the uh the claims on the ad because i remember that ad as a kid yeah i remember seeing but it they too. probably just changed the wording on it and, uh, but that was something that happened in the, in the history of bodybuilding. You know, they've talked about it. The Charles Atlas incident. Yeah. Basically. I mean, it's kind of the same thing that you, you see it a lot with, um, particularly in sort of the wellness area with yeah. like, you know, the vitamin supplements and stuff. They can't come out and say, hey, this shit cures cancer. Cause obviously it doesn't. But they can get around things by saying promotes wellness. Yeah. Because that's vague enough right. that, you know, you can get away. You can't make specific claims about what right. it can do unless you have, like, the evidence to back it up. But you can make, like, real vague statements like that. Yeah. You can't <laughs> say that you fucking built your fucking body and fucking it's Charles Atlas on fucking progressive resistance and push-ups and shit when there's clearly photographs of you in the gym working out with weights. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. You got pictures of him working out with yeah. weight, so there it goes. So they, they had to change it. It's just kind of like, I, I kind of feel like a lot of those weight loss ads are kind of yeah. bullshit, too, because they're like, well, especially not, you know, they're like, hey, we lost weight with this fucking 
I yeah. think bullshit, uh, Penn and Teller's bullshit did an yeah. episode on this one time yeah. where they have these things where it's like, oh, it's the ab crunch roller yeah. or whatever the fuck. And then they show these people like using it. They don't, but you notice they never come out and say that person got those abs using that. Exactly. They just show that person using that. That's yeah. a fitness model. Yeah, yeah exactly. They didn't get the abs like nope. and shit using that thing. Yeah, like shake weight. They just, yeah, they just paid somebody yeah. that already looked like that. Yep, to hold that thing. To hold that thing. Yep. And you're supposed to make the connection in your yeah. mind. They're not allowed to come out and say, right. this person got that body using the shake right. weight right. going like this. They have to be fucking. <laughs> I saw the fucking shake weight commercial back when that shit was on fucking television. You know what I mean? And that fucking gorgeous fitness model with that fucking weight. And I'm and fucking I knew better. I was like, no way did she, did she build that fucking body with that little fucking twenty dollar shake weight. Yeah. Cause that's come out right now and that's fucking a decade worth of work she's got on her. Yeah. And she's but she's Jack. She's Jack on Winstrol and shit. So, well, like, like I said, they yeah. hire fitness models yeah, to be in there. And right. you're supposed to make the association. Right. Oh well. She uses that thing, and she looks like that. Yeah, they so never quite I say use that, that thing, though. but they, they can't. Well, they're, they're not allowed. They're to. not allowed to say that, right? Because yeah. it's not true. No, they're not allowed to. So if they can get around it, yeah, and you know, and if you kind of sue them or something, like they're like, hey, we never said that. You mm. made that assumption. We never said yep. that outright. See, that's how they get around it's association. It. That's how they get around it. Um, yeah, somebody was saying that uh, Anthony Michael Hall called out at at a convention. Called out che- uh, Chevy Chase for being late, and I'm like, that's pretty funny. <laughs> Tyler, the guy said, since uh, Chevy is no- Chevy is notorious for being a dick. Oh, he's I, a dick. I believe, yeah, I've heard. Everybody says. He's I a dick. have never heard a single person say that he was not just a complete flaming asshole. Yeah. Which is, and they say which is not, quite an achievement. And he's not funny. They say yeah. he's not funny at all. That's all his writers and shit. <laughs> so he doesn't have a funny bone in his body. That's so weird to me. Because, like, some of the movies, like, National Lampoon's Vacation and stuff like that, he's, like, pretty funny in those. Mm -hmm. But apparently, like, as a person... No, they say he's not fucking funny That he's, like, really not funny. And he's just, like, a real... real Howard Stern had a lot of records where he called called him and started fucking trolling him over the phone. Chevy Chase over the phone. And he, he would play that on the show every now and then. And fucking dude had no sense of humor. None. Uh, and evidently, everybody that's ever fucking dealt with him tried to joke around with him. He's just like a dick, total dick. No sense of humor. At I all. wonder how uh, how a comedian gets to be like that. Somebody can write for him. He probably buy, you know a lot of lot, a lot of people don't you know, you know fucking get their feelings hurt when I say your favorite rock star or fucking a lot of times or your favorite pop star, your favorite comedian buys a lot of that material. They buy a lot of it. Billy Idol bought most of those songs, but so did Elvis. You know, but you know, at least he kind of fesses up to that. Some of it he wrote, but then he bought some of it. Yeah, and I mean, the thing about it is that if you just have the persona and you have a good voice and stuff like that, yeah, I think most people are kind of like, oh, we prefer if they like write their own material and stuff, but. I don't know. I'm not really that worried about it. Yeah. As long as as long as you are not pretending that you're the shit when you did. Yeah, that simply red song. Don't you forget about me was originally. It's not in, simply red. It's um, who's that? Uh, Simple Minds. Simple Minds. Simple yeah. Minds. That's right. Simple Minds. Uh, Don't you forget about me was originally fucking written for Billy Idol, and he was gonna do it, but then he thought it was too soft. He turned it down. He should have fucking bought it. And then later he came back and did it as a cover, like decades later. He's got. A, and when you hear Billy Idol do do that song, you go, yeah, it makes a lot more sense with him singing it. But it was it was written for him, but he thought it was too soft. Hmm. Tyler said, uh, Chevy Chase had a short-lived talk show. Oh, I remember that. Everybody shit on that talk show, too. Even And that was a long time ago, like, even when that was out. Said he had all the charm and charisma of a dead goldfish. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it only lasted, like, a few episodes, and everyone said it was so terrible that it just yeah. got immediately canceled. He was the Glenn Danzig of humor. <laughs> Like I said, I've seen some movies yeah. that he's in where he's funny and like yeah. that he can, you know, deliver comedy. Like he had good comedic timing. Oh man, Flash! But Flash. yeah, and like Flash, I said, yeah. the the National Lampoon movies and stuff like that that he was in, those yeah. are funny. But um, I don't know. Just I guess personally, I don't I don't know if he really did. Did he ever really do stand up? I kind of feel like mm. he was more like started out at sketch comedy. I don't know. Don't know and I don't know if I he just ever. I see the movies. Yeah, and then I know he likes parlayed into movies, but I don't know if he ever did stand-up comedy. I mean, I know most comedians, you kind of have to, like, go through the fucking run the gauntlet of doing stand-up comedy, but... I think one of the fucking funniest fucking 
comedians of all times, you know, outside of fucking my boy, fucking. Fucking. I should have. I'm fond of drawing a blank. Anyway, fucking. What, I like fucking. The, there's a, a, a Jewish American fucking comic named Jackie Mason. That motherfucker is so funny. Remember him? Yeah, I remember him. Yeah. Jackie Mason was fucking funny. And uh, you can see his stuff on, on YouTube. Yeah, he did free stuff. He was just fucking hilarious. He was just troll. He would troll himself. Just real, just hilarious, you know. Yeah. Call the women in the in the audience as hookers inadvertently, you know. <laughs> it's a compliment if they call you a hooker. Nobody says, you look like a housewife. You look like a housewife. You got to have a certain talent to be a hooker. And he goes, isn't that right, ma'am? Fucking just stupid <laughs> shit like that. It's just fucking funny. <laughs> Ken Knack says, uh, yay, hopefully you guys will be on for a bit longer. Just saw you were live. Yeah, we've only been on for like 25 yeah. minutes, and we haven't even got to the topic yet, really. So, yeah. so, we're still in the warm-up. So up. you're good. We're still in the warm-up phase. Yeah. Rebecca Tun says, Ned Kelly, really? Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, Rebecca, you're Australian, aren't you? Yeah, we're talking mm -hmm. about Ned Kelly. Uh, and then we had Ned Kelly is a legend, him and Martin mm -hmm. Hemeyer. Yeah, see, there you go. Mm. <laughs> What'd you do? Cable fell out. Oh, okay. Yeah, everybody. Okay, everybody's showing up now. Everybody's showing up now. We were talking about what a what a dickhead Chevy Chase was. Yeah. <laughs> I don't remember how we got on that topic. Howard Stern proved it. <laughs> Howard Stern proved it to me that he was a dick. He played all the fucking phone calls he made to him. Uh, but Howard Stern's a dick too, though. Over time, over time, he became a dick. His show isn't funny anymore. Kind of a. Just from another era, you know? It's funny how relevancy moves around. Well, yeah. The old world's falling away. Yeah, it's a, it always happens. It always does, yeah. That's what I mean. That's yeah, vaudeville's long that's, gone. That's the only constant of yeah. the world is change. Yeah, the constant. So don't worry about it. The constant of the world is that the old world falls away. Yeah. It's all replaced by new shit. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> it's supposed to. It's supposed to because some shit just gets too old. It just can't be around anymore. <laughs> <laughs> like me. <laughs> I'm getting. That? I'm uh, getting too old and no. I can't be around anymore. Yeah, What's the yeah. flavor of that drink? Which uh, well, they're both orange juice. Mine has vodka in it, and yours is probably tequila, tequila and orange yeah. juice and something else. Tequila sunrise. Tequila sunrise. Yeah, mine's a screwdriver. DJ Maniac says, I liked Fletch and Nothing But Trouble, which I still need to send. Um, yeah, I remember seeing that and being like, what the fuck did I just watch? But I haven't seen it in a really long time. I think it's one of those infamous movies from the 80s where everyone was like, what the? Like, nobody knew what to make of it. But maybe it aged well. <laughs> I'm not real sure. <laughs> uh, all right. So um, what else do we have to discuss before we get into the into the topic anything in particular mm -mm. oh i meant to mention i was gonna mention this on one of the movie shows but i don't think i ever got around to it but somebody sent me a message that you remember how we did a show a long time ago about the unsolved oklahoma girl scout murders um those three little girls that were like at the girl scout camp and like they all got raped and murdered and like left outside yeah. the tent and like they found them the next morning uh they finally did solve that um thank you katie Hey, from Monster Cat and Wife, it's her 21st birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Thanks for the awesome videos, guys. We appreciate y'all. Oh, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you very much, and happy birthday. Yeah, um, yes, yeah, so they did solve that, and they had DNA, and they figured out that it was that guy, uh, Gene Leroy Hart, who was the guy that was kind of living in the cave, like, near there. He was the guy that they suspected most of the time, but they didn't have enough evidence. Was he still alive when they found out? Uh, I don't know, actually. I don't think so. So I he think been dead. They somehow got a damn sample. But I'd have to yeah. look that up. I meant to look it up, and then I forgot. But yeah, they they did figure yeah. out. I mean, they were pretty sure that that's who it was. They just didn't have enough. Um, yeah. They didn't have enough evidence. But DNA, they got him. Oscar said things started going downhill on the Stern show after Artie called him a pelican. I didn't. I didn't. I wasn't listening when that happened. What year was that? Artie called him a pelican. He does look like a pelican. A little bit, yeah. Why did it go downhill after that? <laughs> he get fired. I mean, he he fired Jackie, and then the show started to suck a little bit more. He started firing people around him. Hmm. Yeah. 
They were the ones that were fucking writing a lot of the funny material. Well, yeah, I kind of feel like that's what happens, too, is that sometimes... I don't know. Is it like writing good comedy yeah. and delivering good comedy aren't necessarily the same no. thing. Sometimes you get that in the same person where they write all their own jokes and they're really good at delivering them. But especially when you have ensemble shows or sketch comedy or something like that, that's usually like a group effort. Well, then that show was several hours long, maybe five hours, six hours a day. I think it was five hours. And it was like every day. Which, holy shit, that's a so lot of think, work. Think of, amount, think of the amount of work you got to do. Yeah. I think it was every day. I think it was. Yeah. I mean, you gotta, yeah. like, after a while, that's just gonna start yeah. to be like, Jesus Christ. It was the internet of its time, in a way. People would call in, he'd make phone calls, and uh, you'd listen to him, and you knew what Howard was doing that day, and what he was thinking, and porn stars would come in, and he'd fucking talk about them, and then fucking could just, he'd have guests come in, and and uh, the internet was starting to emerge, and he was fucking pumping these porn stars fucking web pages and shit and they're fucking they were on there all the time and he'd fucking ask them ridiculous questions and some of it was videotaped you could see it on a channel called E which I don't that's probably not even around anymore um but it was kind of like kind of like our version of the Tonight Show but it was during the day so it got you through work you know and like you said, work now time. that I'm thinking about it, it's like anybody like that, like Howard Stern, or yeah. that had a really popular show that they did every single day for mm -hmm. that many hours. Because what it was like, you said it was like four, like five hours, four, four or five, five hours, hours, something like I think that. It was, yeah, yeah, having to do that every day, holy shit! Right. You, one dude can't handle that. No, you need, you, you need a whole staff. Of you people would need writing a staff. and fucking keeping everybody active and bringing up subjects and. Robin would read the news and then they'd comment on the news. That was the best part, is just the news. It was, you know, it was good it was a good show. It's just um internet slowly replaced it and I mean, he started to become a dick over time. He started to become just like and he was putting out books and everything and movies, called himself the king of all media. He was arrogant and it was kinda of funny, you know, because he was he would like make fun of himself at the same time. But uh what was I gonna say? He um Oh shit, I forgot what I was talking about. I said, he put out books, and uh, the books were fucking funny too. Oh, I mean, what I was saying is he became kind of like some of the other DJs that he was constantly downing. He became kind of like Don, Don Imus. He hated Don Imus. And he put a couple of them out of business by just fucking driving them crazy online and sending his fans to him, sending his fans to his home, to their homes and shit over the years. It's just, you know. He's kind of like rage mobbing. It was almost, it was almost like that. It was almost like Twitter of the day. It was weird, but it didn't last long. I guess you know, decade or so, fifteen years. Yeah, I don't remember like the last. I I kind of remember like the big. I know he's been around like a long time since yeah. then, but I remember kind of like listening to him some in the '90s. But that was the last time I. Remember. Yeah, his heydays was the '90s. And I think I read. Didn't he write a book called Private Parts? I think. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I think it was a good I, book. I think I read that. I think I checked funny it out fucking book. Funny book. Yeah, I remember it being funny. The movie was good too. I might have seen the movie. I don't. The remember. movie was fucking hilarious. I don't remember. It was about his life and shit. Yeah, I think I did see that. And how he became a. But it was a radio, long time ago. How he got into radio and his dad and shit. I mean, yeah, I mean, and the thing about it is, like, doing this show, particularly now that we do, like, a lot of live streams every day and stuff like that, is I can kind of appreciate people that have these big, long shows that they do every day, like, yeah. back in the old days when you had radio, and yeah. how you would need... A whole staff. Like, you said, a whole staff, because, yeah. you no, know, to this one, it's just me. I mean, just, yeah. you know, and so all the movie reviews we do, like, I, yeah. I gotta watch the movies or read the books, and I gotta yeah. research the shit, and all the, and research all the topics and stuff like that, and it takes, like, a long time. Like, so... You know, so I can appreciate that maybe if you just like show up, but even have, even if you have somebody else doing all the work for you or doing all the research for you, you still have to come on and like be on and be yeah. entertaining for yeah. like that period of time. With his show, they had to do the news. They had all kinds of shit they had to do, but it was it, there was a formula to it. But still, that was a, a lot. The scheduling would have been fucking massive. Yeah, and you know he, he did have a big staff. You know he was in a building in a studio and underground yeah, they parking had... lots down in New York. I think it was New York. That's where he lived. Where he was doing it from. Yeah. So, so yeah, and they were making millions and millions of dollars. You know, a yeah. year. So do you have the money to hire people? Yeah. 
that must be that's that's gotta be nice. Mm -hmm. somebody... Although I don't know, even if I had the money to do that, like to have somebody like do research and stuff for me, I probably wouldn't because I would be too afraid they'd screw it up. Yeah. <laughs> Plus, I kind of feel better like doing my own so i kind of know what i'm going to talk about yeah roughly you right. know what i mean i don't like to just have somebody hand me some here this is the topic for today and then i gotta like fucking read it it's like i like to kind of familiarize myself with the yeah. shit so i can kind of go off script if i need to yeah you know what i mean when we, when we originally fucking came up with this show it was because jenny had fucking lost her job mm -hmm. we're like man we're gonna come up with a job for jenny so this is just something we made up for jenny <laughs> and I was kind of like the guest you know what I mean but I just ended up being on it you know all the time you know it's fun yeah it's fun it's better than working for somebody else that's true it's a lot better she was scared at first because she'd never been independent from a company and I had been doing that even when I was even after I left the army for a while I was a fucking independently contracted salesman just trying to survive on my own and you, after you survive for a couple of years doing that, you're going, oh well, yeah, you know what? I don't really need bosses or jobs. I can, you know, I can do this. Just give me the product, I'll go sell it, and fucking blah blah blah. And um, you, being an independent contractor, you you get real used to it after a while. But it it is a mental adjustment. You really feel like you're fucking out on a limb without any fucking security or support. Yeah, I mean, yeah, well, you are. It's like you are, but you can make it. You can survive anyway. It's just not the same. But the thing is, is that every one of those jobs that you had, where you had all that so-called support, those companies closed, or they fucking laid people off, or they're not, you can't depend on them either. Yeah. You've been doing this longer than you were doing that. Yeah, I mean, this and isn't... I, I haven't been doing this longer than, like, my longest job no, that I had, but... No, how much was the longest job? Four, my longest years? job was... Four or five years? No, my lo my longest job was uh, 10 years? 10 years, okay, yeah. Something like so that. So it'll take a long time to reach that. But, you know, those days are over. You know, most most people can't stay 10 years at a job anymore. Not, not today's job market. Yeah, that's true. You're lucky to get three years, four years. Unless you're in something that's like uh, construction or, you know, fucking something having to do with the infrastructure. Yeah, I mean, we've talked about this before. It's like the gig economy. It's shitty in a lot of ways, but, I mean, you have to, like, hustle. You have to, like, pretty work yeah. pretty much all the time Yeah. to make money to survive. But I'm not really sure I'd want to go back to the other way, though. No, I mean, if some, if some people do, that's, like, up to them because I know that some people like that better, but... I don't know. It's it's stressful though. It's still yeah. it's stressful because you never know. I never know. Like from week to week, what you're gonna make, like what I'm gonna make. So I don't really know. Like at the, when the end of the month comes, you know, and the bills are due, I'm just kind of like, man, I hope I have enough this month. I hope I have enough. You know what I mean? Just from. I mean, it's not just it's not just this show. I have. Yeah. Uh, I do freelance graphic design. I do have book yeah. sales. I do all that kind of stuff. So, but I never know. Like from month to month, how much I'm gonna make, which is a little bit. It tends to scary. work out. It, it usually it does. It usually does. Sometimes I'm a little bit short. Sometimes I'm all right, but... Yeah, and if it's short, it's okay. I can cover shit. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, but it's just as, as long, you know, because you have most of it. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? That it's, you yeah, know it's I mean? not like I have it's not. Like no, I, it's yeah, not like it's, I got to fucking throw out $1,000 that month. You know what I mean? So it's yeah, not really a big had deal. A, yeah, you've never had to do It's that. only like 50 here, 100 here. It's just not really a big deal. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I don't think I've ever been more than like maybe a hundred or two hundred dollars yeah. short. Yeah, it's of never, all, it's of never even really put me out or anything. Yeah, so, so I, it's like I, the, I don't even remember when it happened. I didn't, you know, I didn't really even really notice it because we'll spend that in a fucking club. We'll spend a hundred bucks in a club. Well, we did last week. We did last. Week. <laughs> I think you know. that was one hundred and three dollars. Yeah, one hundred and three. Well, for both, gas. that's for, for both, both of us. us. Not, not counting not. gas. Oh yeah, that's right. And we not had counting a, gas. And we had to buy gas too. Yeah. So there was that. But I we had. I gotta get you some new clothes too. Yeah, my clothes are wearing out. Your clothes are wearing. I gotta get you some new fucking pants and shit. Some cool ass fucking pants. Yeah. Some, some teddy shirts. Teddy shirts. There's not enough fucking teddies. We go out fucking hiding and shit, fucking with the shit now. I'm gonna, let me talk. We're gonna get you some fucking. I want them fucking things up around your ears. Yeah, that'll be that'll like be real that. that'll be real it'll comfortable be for me. Be comfortable, yeah. He just wants me. I to walk be, in. And he just wants. Looking. He just wants me. He just showing wants me to off. be uncomfortable. Showing her off all night. 
walk so I could just stand there and be like, wow, I wish I she could dance. She stand there and she dances all fucking night. Listen. Yeah, well, I wouldn't if I was all uncomfortable. I'm just, okay. All right. <laughs> it's going to be okay. Is it? It's going to be okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to reassure her. It's almost time for me to make another drink. You're doing okay? You got half of it, right? Yeah, I still got half of mine. And lips. then when I come back, we'll start the show. Okay. We'll start the top. I think everybody's worked out. How many are, how many are in there? I don't know. 30? I don't know. I can't see it on my thing. You have to see it on your thing. Because I don't even have YouTube open on here. I just have OBS open. Yeah, just like, did anybody, I got this really cool shirt from uh, FYE the other day, like in the mall. I got this one and I got the Cthulhu one that I wore like the other day. It's those, um, you know, the creature from the Black Lagoon one that I have? And what the fuck is this thing called? Riot Society, that's right. And I guess they have all these shirts that they do, like, um, that are exclusive to FYE. And they have, like, a whole line of them. So I bought a Creature from the Black Lagoon one in there the other day. And then when I was in there a couple weeks ago, I got the Creep Show one and the Hellraiser one, which are, like, the long sleeved ones. And then we were in there the other day before we went and saw Firestarter. Um, they had... The Cthulhu shirt, which I wanted before, but they only had extra, extra large. I was like, no, I need a small because I can't do, I can't do the man shirts in extra, extra large. It's just too baggy. If, if they only have man cuts of the shirt, then I need a small because otherwise it just looks like really baggy. What are you talking about? So the shirt. What shirt? The, well, this one and oh. the Cthulhu one. Oh, okay, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, so finally they had the they got a new shipment of the Cthulhu ones in, so I was like, woohoo, they got the small, and they still had the deal on where if you bought one shirt, you got the second one for half off. So I was like, well, shit, bitch, I'm going to get this one, too. I'm going to get, like, this Halloween one. It says something at the bottom. I think it says the nightmare. The nightmare isn't over, it says at the bottom. Oh, Can X going, whoa, the origins of 13 o'clock. Hell, yeah, it's amazing. You know, oh, yeah, you know. We've talked about this so many times, but the show's been going on for a long time. I mean, we get and new people all the, the time, though, and like yeah. sometimes they might not go back and like watch yeah. the old ones. The old catalog. We've for a long time, we didn't even have a video component. I think we only yeah. started doing... Well, shit, we only started doing live streams at about episode 200, and then it wasn't every week. I think that was just like a special thing that we did. And for a long time, we didn't even have a video component. Like It was a big deal used to be we just recorded the audio and then I did just like a slideshow which took yeah. forever yeah it's so I that was one of the ways like when we had a video component even though in some ways I was kind of like oh I don't know if I want to do that but in a lot of ways that freed up a lot of time because I didn't have to do these really exhaustive edited slideshows like I did before which took hours and hours so that's why we started expanding out and doing more shows because I had more time because, you know, before that, we really only did, we did the episode, and then we did, like, a movie review. I yeah. think that was all we did, like, every week. Yeah. And now we have something going up, like, every day. Yeah, it, it grew. The show grew to where we had to get like bigger, a weed. bigger and bigger. <laughs> and a, lot, and a lot of that had to do with the, the fact that in the algorithms, you got to take up a bunch of bandwidth to make ad revenue. And if you don't put something up regularly, they, YouTube tries to move you down in the algorithms. Our growth has always been steady, but I always fucking suspected that they have a slightly shadow band or limited. That I think they're preferring other other uh, um, other shows, maybe like corporate type shows. I don't know. And you don't even have YouTube Red, do you? I don't know. I wonder if we moved this to YouTube Red because we're paying monthly. I wonder if that would actually move us up in the algorithms. I don't know. Because you know this is like a free YouTube channel. Well, I mean, the thing about it is that I feel like some channels that are bigger can afford to put up less. Because yeah. I noticed that, like, some channels that I really like that have more subscribers than us, they only put up one or yeah. two videos a week. But yeah. they have a lot more subscribers than we do, so they could probably afford to do that. So, because they have, like, a longer... And some of them, yeah. it's, like, less than that. Like, they only put up a couple a month or something. Yeah. But you have to be, like, pretty well-known before you can get away with doing that. Yeah. Okay, so that's uh, Katie Perez. She sent us five. That, that's Monster Cat's wife. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Monster, yeah. Monster Cat. Um, I got him on Facebook. I've seen. I've seen y'all's photographs. Fucking y'all are a cute couple and shit. Young couple. Twenty one and you're married already. Shit, man. That's quite a commitment. Twenty one. I was fucking in the army. Fucking, um, in Korea. Uh, in brothels on the. I've <laughs> been hanging out on the DMZ. I don't understand. But anyway, you. Uh, fucking Ma Monster Cat's got some badass dreads though. I like. I don't know where he's from, but. 
He's got you. You guys fucking look cool. I go back and check. I think he might be southern. I'm not sure. I got married when I was 22. Yeah, that's true. She married. She married young. Yeah, I married too. We got yeah. too. But you know, obviously. Well, I mean, I was married for what 14 years. 14 yeah. years. Yeah, like but 14, 15 years. Before I before I met you. All right, Straw Dog said that this Howard Stern show on E was the greatest thing back in the 90s. It was. It was fucking cool back then. It was fun, yeah. Because you could see what they were talking about on the show earlier before you can finally see it. Um, and then Danny Rowland goes, he says, there was an episode in, where Howard Stern, in the Howard Stern show where Yucko the Clown called in from a gas station with a bullseye sign during the DC epic sniper rampage. Oh, that would have been fucking funny as fuck. <laughs> Uh, Tyler, the guy says, wasn't Private Parts the only movie that he was in? I think so. Private Parts is actually a really good movie. And the yeah, book is I'm, good, too. I remember it being good. Yeah. And I remember the book being funny. And Oscar's talking about Hank the Ag Angry Drunken Dwarf. Yeah. And then Cam guy says, I wanted to bleach my hair when I saw Tom in the older podcast. Oh, really? That's fucking cool. <laughs> I actually, bleaching my hair fucking blonde. It, it, it was damn near white. Um, Pokey. Um, actually, what what kind of inspired me to do that? That that's a, that's my Rob Halford hair haircut. <laughs> Rob Halford had that back in the day, but uh, shit, that was over ten years ago. I'm so thin in the front that fucking even having hair is a waste of time now. I let it grow out a couple days ago. I'm looking at it and going, nah, that's looking pretty bad. And uh, because of the androgens and all the shit that I'm on, it's there's less hair now, and uh, it's all salt and pepper now. Do you know that? No, I haven't uh, seen it in a long time. You didn't notice that? I mean, all, I imagined it probably. Yeah, Mine probably is pepper. too, but I'm It's not. all salt and pepper now. I, d I dyed mine black for like years and years and years, so I have no yeah. idea what color it actually there is. There is some stuff that, that's out there, some some topical steroids that you can put on there that evidently will cause hair to re regrow. And there's another a uh, couple different things. And you can get a whole head of hair to grow back, but I don't know if I want to even fucking bother. I, I think I look pretty good bald. I think I look pretty good bald. I mean, if you're a dude and you look good bald, then yeah. go with being bald. It seems like so much easier. I wish I looked yeah. good bald because my hair is a fucking huge pain in the ass. And when I was young, and when I was young in the service, I was damn near bald all the time anyway. I was just shaved down. I mean, to nothing. It, it's so low maintenance. So yeah, yeah. That's what I like about it. Um, you're not as pretty, and motherfucker, I got a whole closet where the, where the wigs. If I want hair, I'll just go get and fucking. Put I'm some wearing hair your. On. I'm wearing yours. Yeah, you wearing wearing a dancing wig. Yeah, I'm wearing the dancing, dancing wig. wig. Hopefully, yeah. I don't look like dancing with it on. No, Holy shit, no. that would be bad. Yeah. I just wanted the I just wanted the plain black today. Yeah. I actually ordered another like plain black one that's like that's cut like this one, but not quite as long. Because yeah. this one is getting a little yeah. knotty and it's a little long and kind of like a pain in the ass. So yeah. I got one that's like this long. Yeah. You know what I mean? I just didn't want to be bald and fat. Be <laughs> bald and fat is like uh, that's bad. But you get bald and jacked, no, that's fine. You can you can go with that. All the fucking Jason Statham and The Rock and all those dudes, they're all fucking bald and they're all fucking jacked. Uh it's just you don't want to be bald and fat. That's the that's the difference. Looking like Uncle Fester. You like Uncle Fester and shit. <laughs> And Although Uncle Fester is kind of cool looking. That was starting to kind of happen as I was getting older. I was going fucking... Because you just cannot keep a slender look when you start approaching your mid-40s. Your, 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 your hormones just start to change, and you're going to start getting kind of pot-bellied if you, if you don't get in that gym. And if you can get in that gym hard enough to stop all the fucking effects of aging, you're going to start getting jacked. But you're not gonna feel good because your testosterone levels are too young, too too low. So you're gonna have to get on HRT. Once you're on HRT, though, now you're immune to steroids. You might as well just take some steroids every now and then too, and get a nice fucking refresh. You know, just keep refreshing that shit. Everybody else is doing it. All them people you see on those MCU Marvel Universe shit, they're all on. They're all on shit. And the girls too. What are you doing, Poke? She goes in the. <laughs> Pookie opened the fucking, she opened the fucking cabinet underneath the sink and went underneath the sink. She's going, and what are you doing in there? What you doing in there, Pook? Nothing. Okay, come on out. There's nothing yeah. in there. It All that's in there is my makeup mirror and my coffee stuff. She thinks it goes to another house. Or she thinks it goes outside. Yeah, I'm yeah. not sure what she thinks. You're so cutie. Come on. She's like, sure. she's right there. <laughs> she goes in there a minute yeah. and then comes out going, ah, that was boring. Yeah, she I was talking about John Estetter. Yeah, all those old characters, man, they were fucking great, man. 
I would love to have the budget where we could build something like that here, but we'd have to get a whole another studio or we could have a cast and but that will never happen again. That'll never happen again. Those those morning fucking zoo shows that was only for radio. Um but if you've been following the show for a long time, like a lot of you guys said, uh, uh, have, fucking Stern's show was one of the influences for this show. One of them. I kind of wanted a paranormal and unsolved, mur unsolved mystery type true crime version of something like that, which I think maybe we have. I don't know. It's just but we wanted Jen. one, and especially when we started live streaming, we wanted one that was kind of like a hangout, too. Yeah. Like, that wasn't overly... Right. Because I feel like there's a lot of channels online where you can just go and have somebody, like, have a voiceover, like, read the Wikipedia entry yeah. to you, um, you know, and get the facts. Like, I want to get the stuff right. Like, yeah. I do actually want to talk about the topic yeah. and get all the stuff right as far as I can. But I also kind of wanted it to be, like, more casual, like a more hangout. Type exactly, thing. because Jenny and I knew that we would never really have the mainstream demographic anyway. So you might as well just kind of target and market it to people who wanted to hang out or their people at work who need something to listen to to get them through the work day. It was going to be that kind of shit where we had a small, strong following of, you know, a few people that would send us fucking super chats and fucking be regulars and fucking make comments, you know what I mean? Because when we started, we couldn't see the comments. We were on a fucking podcast. Well, I think it was Podbean, wasn't it? We had well, that was one of the, yeah. One of the ones we were on when we first fucking started. And we had like 50,000 people downloading quick. But we never had any interaction. And we never got anything out of it. So we're like, look, look we're going to go to YouTube where we can have some interaction. You know. And it changed the nature of the show, I think, for a better. A lot better. Yeah. Once we got to meet you guys and that we could fucking talk through, you know, at least through the messages, then... And then some of y'all are fucking, I talked to instant messages. Me and Khan fucking instant, me and Khan of Otsland over in Mexico, we, we fucking instant message almost every day. And Bee's Nest, you know. Over just bullshit. I mean, it doesn't have anything to do with the show. Just the news or, you know, drugs or whatever. Fucking <laughs> what HRT and fucking hormones and, you know, that kind of stuff. All right, so... About time to start, probably. Are we ready? Yeah, we're yeah. almost an hour in, so me, maybe... Oh, yeah, let me catch up with the comments. Seth B says, just got here, Aussie Icon episode. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, this is one that has been requested multiple times. Yeah. And I'd been wanting to, like, do a show on it for a long time, because it was something I didn't... I Like, I knew kind of vaguely the story, but I didn't know a lot about it, so... Um, so I'm glad we're finally getting around to it. You know. I didn't really think about it ahead of time, because I was like, oh, we should have done, like, some big spectacular special thing for episode 300 but I was like ah well Sass just showed up what's up Sass yeah that's what I was just saying cutie pie <laughs> and then uh, yeah Bruce Willis that's right John Bruce Willis was in and out of shape being bald well he lost all his hair anyway Bruce was always cool though but I mean back in the 90s I don't know if it got out but Bruce was fucking when he was young he was already bald this is like after uh, fucking Demi and all that kind of shit and Bruce was friends with all the fucking porn stars. Uh, he was banging all the fucking porn stars uh, over in L.A. That's who he hung out with. A lot of those guys did. Porn star girlfriends. Tammy says, this is by far my favorite YouTube channel. Oh, oh, thank, you. oh thank you. I tell people all the time about my friends on YouTube. Appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, you know. We could, I mean, it's you guys. It's a personalized show. Yeah, you guys come here like every single, and we're on all the fucking time. I would get sick of us if I wasn't us. You know what I'm saying? So the fact that like the same people like show up all the time, and I was like, how are they not sick of us? That's pretty awesome. But well, the, yeah, so yeah. Not every show is the same, and fucking me and Jenny will fight every now and then. But y'all, <laughs> we have bad days and good days, but it's the same with y'all too. That was the part of the well, idea of the show. Yeah, I mean, I guess that that's the, the thing. We're just the, like human. We're not right. like. <laughs> And this is, like I said, this is not, we're not, like, put on. This no. is, we're just sitting here, like, talking like we would normally talk. Yeah. If the camera wasn't on. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I well, mean? Oh, it gets wilder. It's not like we normally would. Come, <laughs> come meet us at the club or go, come meet some of our <laughs> friends and shit down at the goth club. Or if I go to the biker bar, fucking that one, too. Fucking, yeah. Uh, no, it's different. If you're in Florida, you know, fucking, I, we put out what clubs we go to. You can meet us there. We go to Mannequin's. 
And I go to the fucking the Oasis here in Eustis. That's the Midnight biker park. The but fucking, if you drop me a line, you tell us when you're going to be there. Fucking, what We're normally there on a Friday or a Saturday, or Saturdays usually at the Mannequins. And then sometimes we go to... Uh, then we have we got to check out the new independent bar. Yeah, Barbarella. Barbarella's, which haven't been there yet. Yeah, we haven't been since they moved because yeah. it's farther. Yeah, Dimitri's spins the Goth Night there. We do all the Jenny does all the graphic designs. I help promote it. And fucking and uh, man, she comes up with some po- from the posters for some of these Goth uh, nights. You guys would fucking love them, man. Fucking spooky vampire, vampiric looking. Women look like something out of the damn haunted house from Disneyland or something. It looks fucking great. If you guys, shit, where, you don't have any of your stuff back here, do you? I don't think I do now. Yeah, we need to have some of stuff. Fuck, I wanted that shit and put framed like that and put inside the house, going down the hallways. Some of the stuff that she's done looks fucking. Great. I still have all of them somewhere. Yeah, she got she's got the data. We just had to have it printed out. I just made one for mannequins. They're yeah. doing June third. They're doing yeah. witches ball. Yeah. And uh, then they're doing a fetish party yeah. uh, at the end of June. She's done so many black metal album covers for all these fucking black metal bands. Oh, they haven't done that late recently, have you? No, not for a while. Because Dimani's out of that. But then uh, did a lot of stuff for um, A Starry Night, a lot of their promotional materials. You did a couple of their albums, I think. Yeah. The inner jackets and stuff. Um, you know, and she did a bunch of stuff for... Uh, uh, liquor companies. And if you look at it, you know, it doesn't, but that's, that paid, you know, a lot of the liquor company stuff. DJ Maniac says, uh, Octavio is DJing up here on Friday. Yeah, yeah, Octavio. Hey, yeah. hey, say hi to him. Yes, I haven't yeah. seen him in a, in a few he's, months, that's my, That's my buddy. Yeah, he's cool. Right. May have to stop in and see him. Yeah, if you do, like, uh, tell him hi from us. Yeah. Yeah, he goes all over the place. Yeah, he's a nice dude. I like him a lot. Yeah. I like him a lot. And let's see. He had this Russian girlfriend. Nah, never mind. I can talk about that. <laughs> I'm not talk about that. <laughs> Why, was, Woody? And that, no, never mind. You, no, I'm not going to say anything about that. <laughs> yeah, you probably would. She was fucking smoking hot. Remember the one? She had the implants and all that? Fucking. A va- I vaguely It's not remember. coming to your mind what happened. It didn't have anything to do with him. No, it, it was just some, si- some sideways shit. We can't talk about that. No. It's I mean, I kind of remember something, but I don't remember yeah. like all the details. That was a while back. He had this fucking hot girlfriend. He's not going to talk about it, but he's going to talk, gonna talk about, about it. I'm going to talk about it. Anyway. <laughs> girl, On a scale of one to ten, she's maybe like maybe like a nine. Fucking fantastic body. Fucking rock hard fucking implants and shit. Long black hair. She's just this goth fucking... She looked like a fucking goth fucking vampire porn star queen. That's what she looked like. Yeah. That's all I'm going to say about it. Seth B says, I'm jealous of that biker bar. It looks like such a cool place to chill out and have a few drinks. Plus, the music is my style of music. Well, that's because I was playing it. I was spinning. Yeah. <laughs> there's a, there's a, he uh, took over the... I took over the jukebox. Because <laughs> um, you can... The jukebox is online. You can you, you, It's like an app. And you can fucking control that jukebox and you pay it out, out of your fucking account. Um, so I was spinning stuff on it and then taking videos, but, um, you go in there, man, it's like Moss Eisley Starport fucking, you know what I mean? There's fucking cameras everywhere looking down, you know, people have been fucking killed in there. You know, it's not, it's wretched fun. Hive of scum it is a wretched hive of scum and, <laughs> and evil. Okay. Um, but no, I'm, I'm, I'm almost famous in there now. He's almost famous. Almost famous, yeah. DJ Maniac says we all had a Russian girlfriend at one point. Time. Yeah. <laughs> and Seth says there's a threesome story coming up. The threesome stories? There's a thought of those. Well, about the Russian girlfriend. That's oh, the Russian girlfriend. Yeah, never mind. <laughs> never mind. So I don't have permission to talk about that one. That's what I mean. I legit don't remember exactly what happened. You were at the club. I know I was, but okay. I know I was. But the thing about it is that sometimes when I'm there, one, sometimes yeah. I'm kind of drunk, and two, um, the music is so loud that I can't really hear much of anything. So I only yeah. hear about like ten percent of like people's conversations. Okay. 
So sometimes people will be like, oh my God, blah, blah, blah. And all I hear is, burr, 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 burr. Yeah, like, I can't okay. really. So I'm just kind of like, cool. Yeah. Like, I can't hear you. So, <laughs> so a lot of times I only have to get like the details like after the fact because I'm not entirely sure. Like, what's she going wasn't on. really a girlfriend of his. She was a girl that he was hitting at the time. And that's all I'm going to say. Don't ask him about it. All right. Don't ask him about it. He's, you know, he's going to. No. <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't have brought it up. If you do bring it up, blame no. it on Tom. <laughs> yeah, dude, they just hand them out to goth DJs like promo CDs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're a goth DJ, you're gonna get a goth. You gonna get a Russian girlfriend. Here you go. Here, Russian so. gothic girlfriend. They just send it. They just give her to you like wrapped in plastic yeah. or whatever. That's pretty <clears throat> funny. All right, so... Imagine if Morticia Adams was a porn star, and that's what you were dealing with. Yeah, okay. That's what she was like. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right, so we've been going for an hour, so okay. Okay, let's talk about the we gotta actual... we got to get to this case. Let's, yeah. let's talk about the actual, to, yeah. actual topic. Okay. I have a feeling, Tom, that you might like this guy. No, I'm already fucking... I'm already, <laughs> I'm already like... I'm already warmed up because he's in good company already. i got an idea what we're dealing with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right, so Ned Kelly. Now, for the Australians here among us, this will probably all be very right. familiar to you, but I kind of feel like maybe, maybe he's not as well known in other parts of the world as he is in Australia because he's massively famous there. Uh, so, yeah, kind of a folk hero, but some people just kind of think he's a villain, so we'll get into that later. But he's kind of what used to be known as a bush ranger, which I guess was something like, well, it was like an outlaw, but you kind of like, hid out in the bush, like, evading the authorities and all that kind of stuff. Uh, he led a gang Storm called the Warm. Kelly Gang. Oh, yeah. Oh, shit. Hopefully. Guys, that was just a big thing of thunder. Hopefully our connection will hold. Yeah. I mean, oh, forgot. We got a better connection now. Yeah, I think we mentioned that. We got. We actually got a second... Second box. Uh, mode, or mo Motor. thing. Yeah, yeah. and we're in, we're, and it's right here underneath the thing. Right there. So we've got one upstairs and one downstairs, and we're hardwired right into it. So, yeah. if we lose a connection, everything's fast. Like, I look at my fucking shit here, because on my wireless, and everything is real fast now. There's no lags, nothing. So, it's great. But if we lose connection, it's not us. It's this whole area. Okay. Yeah, because yeah, I just heard thunder, but it might be yeah. all right. But it's, you know. Right. It's getting to be that time of year where it's going to storm pretty right. much every day. Uh, yeah, Seth B says, we were taught about Ned Kelly in primary school. He's iconic. Yeah, I kind of feel like every Australian knows who he is. Uh, DJ Maniac says, Yahoo Serious played him at some point, didn't he? I think that Yahoo Serious was in that movie from the 90s called Reckless Kelly, which is sort of about Ned Kelly. So, yeah, if, uh, if that's the movie that you're thinking of. So, yeah, so he's essentially an outlaw. Uh, he led a gang called the Kelly Gang and also a cop killer. So there's that. Okay. Um, and again, we were talking about earlier his uh, kind of suit that he made, this bulletproof armor, like this homemade armor, uh, yeah. very, very iconic. And there are statues of that, like, uh, you know, in... I'm pretty South sure Road. I've seen this. Yeah, I mean, there's pictures of it. Like, yeah. there's photographs of him, like, wearing the shit. Yeah. It looks, it kind of looks like... A, like a Dollar General version of like a suit of armor. It is yeah. metal and it has like, it's like a bucket shaped head with just like a slit. The so like, happening over it's here? my, it's just my phone ringing. Oh, okay. Just right. calm down. Okay. It's just on vibrate. Okay. It's, you know. Sounds like I'm being attacked by a sex toy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a sex toy. It's a phone, <laughs> Grandpa. Okay. It's okay. a phone. Okay. <laughs> it's just my phone is over there and it's my uh, so yeah, so basically, uh, you know, even, not even too long after he died, he became like a huge cultural icon. And, and I'm talking about like fucking, even before the 1940s, I think there were like more than 40 books written about him. There were songs about like ballads and shit like that that came out like right after his death. Um, there have been like a fuck ton of movies about him. And honestly, the first movie that was made about him, which was called The Story of the Kelly Gang, it came out in 1906. And this is supposedly the world's first dramatic feature-length film was about Ned Kelly, allegedly. Uh, so they also made another one that was called The Glen Rowan Affair. That was 1951. The one we mentioned earlier, um, 1970, that was just called Ned Kelly, that had Mick Jagger in it, playing him. 
You had one called The Last Outlaw that came out in 1980. There was one in 2003 with Heath Ledger in it. That was just called Ned Kelly also. And there was one from 2019 called The True Story of uh, the Kelly Gang. And like I said, there was one called Reckless Kelly, which was like a, a comedy that was sort of based on him as well. So hugely, hugely famous, uh, hugely famous dude. And as I mentioned earlier, all the sites associated with significant events in the life and times of <laughs> Ned Kelly and the Kelly gang uh, draw thousands and thousands of tourists a year. And there's actually, if you look, if you search like Ned Kelly on YouTube, there is actually a really good kind of Australian documentary. I don't know what year it came out. It looks like probably a few years old, but it kind of shows a lot of the sites, which I thought was cool, like what they looked like whenever the, whenever the documentary was filmed. All right. So let's get into like a little bit of background of like what was going on around this time period in this area. So you had this, the Port Phillip district in New South Wales. Now in 1851, uh, this district separated from the rest of New, New South Wales and became the colony of Victoria, obviously named after the British queen. Now that same year, 1851, was also the year that gold was discovered in this area. So in 1851, the population of Victoria was 80,000, and 10 years later, it had ballooned to 540,000, and this is almost entirely attributable to the gold rush. Now, as you might imagine, all of these people coming into this new district, into Victoria, was a big problem because they didn't have enough law enforcement to kind of like maintain order. And the few cops that they did have there, the people that lived there didn't really much care for them because they thought that there was a lot of police corruption and that, you know, so there was a, a lot of bad blood between a lot of the migrants and the settlers that came to the area and the small amount of cops that were there that were supposed to be enforcing the law. So what the police force in Victoria did then was they started recruiting cops from the UK and problem was that most of the cops that came over to Australia uh, were Protestants and a lot of the people that lived in Victoria, like the, a lot of the immigrants that lived there were Irish and specifically were Irish Catholic. So um, again, there was a lot of conflict between I mean, that might have been one of the main things is that like a lot of the cops being Protestant and a lot of the people they were supposedly, you know, trying to keep in line were Catholics and they didn't like each other. So uh, that was kind of a lot of there was a lot of uh, conflict at that time. Now, uh, another thing that was going on, too, was that a lot of the Irish Catholic that had moved into the area at this time um, were usually poor. And what ended up happening was that there had been some people like some I don't know I think most of them were uh, English also and they had come to Australia and kind of taken sort of like the best parcels of land now they called these people squatters so squatters doesn't mean like in modern parlance where it's just kind of like hey I'm gonna go in an abandoned building and live there I'm squatting when they say squatters in that context in this context it means that these were really wealthy people that usually came from the UK and they took up like all these really nice like parcels of land uh you know the the land that was actually like productive as far as farmland goes and they you know and they had a lot of money and they were working the farms there and because these squatters had a bunch of money they also could influence uh the local police and also the local governments and could kind of um you know make laws that were more amenable to them uh, as opposed to the poor migrant workers, many of whom were Irish. Now, there, so there was a thing that was called, the families that were called selectors. These were usually, like the British Crown gave these families tracts of land in Australia with the, you know, th they are kind of like, well, we'll give you this land, but you have to like clear all the trees off it. You have to like farm it and stuff like that. But obviously, because all the squatters had got there first and had taken all the good shit and they had the money to, like, keep hold of their shit, 
when these families got sent over there and said, hey, here's some land for you, it was like really, really shitty land and you couldn't like really grow anything on it. So obviously, you know, they remained poor while these kind of like rich guys kept like, they were like, oh, well, if you, if you got like uh, starved off your land, they would just take that too and just be like, oh, we'll just suck it up into our, the land that we already have. So again, so that wasn't just like the religious, like, uh, you know, Protestant versus Catholic thing, but you also had, you know, big, like rich versus poor kind of situation going on as well. Uh, so kind of wasn't a good situation. So uh, I kind of feel like the conflicts between this wealthy group of squatters and the poorer migrant workers who were the, the selector families, um, that was kind of like a cause of a lot of like social problems in Australia going forward for many, many years. So into this sort of, uh, you know, thing that was going on, uh, Edward Kelly, who, you know, was na called Ned, he was born, they're not sure if he was born in December of 1854 or June of 1855, but one of those two things, at a place called, and I think it's pronounced Beaveridge, Victoria. It looks like beverage. And I have heard it pronounced Beaveridge. that. Beaveridge. But I, th I think it's be it, I think it's Beaveridge. Well, I was watching, like, because I said, well, I want to watch some Australian documentaries so I get, like, the pronunciation of these place names right yeah. because I don't want to, like, fuck it up. But that one was confusing because I saw one documentary and they kept saying Beaveridge, which is what it looks like, but I think it's actually Beaveridge. Yeah, it's a t whole town filled with nothing but girls' schools in it. <laughs> They're filming porn there, Beaver. <laughs> yeah, so that's the porn, the porn town. Yeah, it's porn town. <laughs> Tyler, the guy says Ned Kelly is the original Iron Man. Yeah. Yeah. No, I got an idea what's happening. <laughs> Strong78 said Yahoo Serious was an underrated genius. Young Einstein is a classic. I remember really liking that movie, but I haven't Which seen one? it. I haven't seen it in a long time. Which one? Young Einstein with Yahoo Serious. I don't know that one. You don't remember that movie? They used to show it on cable all the time. No. Oh, I don't think it was an Australian it. movie. Okay. Didn't see it. But yeah. <laughs> I saw Young Frankenstein. That's a completely different movie. Completely different. That's a fucking classic, man. I love Young Frankenstein. Yeah. Masterpiece. Yeah. Yeah, we reviewed that not too long ago, actually. Yeah. So yeah, so Ned Kelly back was... When Mel, back when Mel Gibson... <laughs> no, Mel back Gibson? When, back when Mel Brooks was on cocaine. Yeah. He was great when he was on coke. Some people are. Yeah. Some people it just turns him into like assholes, but nah, when Brooks was on cocaine, he was fucking his movies were fucking great. Just like every it's just like everything else. Some people <laughs> yeah. can handle the drugs and it yeah, makes them better. Yeah, yeah. And some people it just makes them worse. Yeah. You, and you never know which one it's going to be until Yeah. until you do it. Oh, more Damn. thunder. Okay. So, uh where was I? So Ned Kelly, he was the uh oldest son of a guy named John Red Kelly and his wife Ellen. Now his dad was actually from Tipperary, Ireland. And in 1841, his dad had been sentenced to seven years for stealing two pigs. And back in the 1840s and yeah, in that time period, if you got uh, they you know convicted of like crimes like that, they'd send you off to Australia. You know, that's, that's where they set their contract. Seven years for two pigs. Two pigs, yeah. A little harsh. Yeah. That's what happened when you don't have no money. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, here here in the American continent, if you stole a horse, it was death. But the situation was very different. If you stole a man's horse out in the West, that's the same as killing him. So they hung you for that. But uh, they, Well, they did it. in Australia as well. Yeah. It's yeah, like, it wasn't. Uh, they, they took it very seriously. They took that shit very seriously because you're putting another person's life at risk. And horses were fucking important, all right? Pigs, come on. That's well, not I that mean, important. I know. Yeah, seven Maybe, years for two pigs. Yeah, seven years. But see, yeah, nah. I thought that too. It sounds, well, oh, well, just wait. Seven just, years is a long wait. fucking time. It is. I can and understand. he got sent to a totally different country. Yeah. Like, he was for, he was Irish. Yeah, they two, sent him to Australia. I would think two pigs would be 18 months, you know. Yeah. Local. You know, they don't send you away for that shit. Whatever. Yeah. Well, you know. Yeah. Like I said, it's a lot of a lot of the sentences in this. I was just kind of like seriously. But yeah. then the weird thing is like sometimes people would get away with like doing shit that you probably like get electrocuted for nowadays. But then sometimes you do like some little piddling shit. And yeah. It's like, like nope, twenty yeah. years. Right. You know, <laughs> I'm just kind of like okay. 
justice is uh, just not not applied like yeah. the same across the board. What I did like about the old ways, though, is that uh, because there was no fucking professional police forces out on the range, you were on the honor system. If you caught a horse thief, it was uh, you were judge, jury, and executioner. I caught you stealing a horse, and I'm gonna hang you. I kind of like that. I kind of like that in a way. It yeah, worked. I mean, it worked. Yeah, it did. But then, um, in the, uh, but then on the other hand, it's just kind of like, well, I just don't like that dude's face, so I'm gonna hang him and say he did. Some well, shit you, like you that. didn't have to do that though. They just yeah. shot it out if they didn't like that dude. <laughs> That's true. But uh, no, if 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 you stole a horse, they would hang you. And you didn't have to go to court for it. Just it was oh, we're, range we're, we're justice. To, we're getting to some horse stealing. Yeah, it was just range. That was range justice. Um, but no, if you wanted a guy dead, you didn't like him, then you didn't bother with any kind of fucking accusing anybody of a crime. You just shot it out because there weren't any witnesses anyway. Boy, you John, hear that? Yeah. Damn, it's fucking Iron Man's coming. John Gora said that was the subplot in Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, the exiled pig thief killer. Yeah, pig killer. Yeah. 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 So I wonder if this is probably what it was based on, maybe. Oh. But now, this isn't Ned Kelly. This is his dad, yeah. Red. Right. So that's that's how Ned Kelly ended up in Australia, was because his dad got uh, yeah. got convicted of stealing pigs and was sent there because, you know, that's where they sent the convicts. So he did his seven years in Australia. Uh, so his sentence was up in 1848. And he goes to the Port Phillip district, which, like I said, was breaking off and became Victoria. And then in 1850, he married um, his wife, Ellen, who was 18 at the time. And she had um, her parents, James and Mary Quinn. We kind of get into that a little bit later. And they ended up having uh, five daughters and three sons. Now, the dad was kind of like a low-level criminal, I guess. I mean, the kind of the whole family ended up being sort of like low-level criminals, kind of. Now, uh, the dad, Red, he actually stole a calf in 1865 and got sentenced to six months hard labor for that. And after a while, he was just like, you know what, I just can't fucking do this shit anymore and drank himself to death. Mm. So he ended up dying a couple days after Christmas, 1866, leaving the oldest son, Ned, who was about 11, 12 years old at the time. So he was kind of like left to provide for his family, which, you know, was his widowed mom and a whole bunch of kids that were younger than him. And they were poor as shit. Because, like I said, they were on this land that wasn't uh, all that productive. Now, Ned had been attending school until his father died. But after his dad died, they're basically are broke as shit. So Ellen, who was his mom, she's a widow now, and the kids, they moved to this kind of shack on uh, 11 Mile Creek. This is halfway between Greta, I think it's Greta, it looks like Greta, but I think it's pronounced Greta, and Glen Rowan. This was Northern Victoria. Now, Ellen's dad, James, who I just mentioned earlier, he had 25,000 acres up there, which sounds like a lot, but the land was like kind of shitty, but he did have like some cows and stuff, so they had to kind of go up there and stay with them. Now, James and uh, some other boys that had married into the family, they kind of had um, a horse and cattle thieving thing going on, allegedly. That's what the police in the area suspected that they kind of had a little bit of an organized horse thief thing going on, which was actually among kind of the poor families of the area was fairly common because, like I said, I kind of feel like they saw it as sort of like a Robin Hood thing because there were all these like wealthy merchants that had all the best land and they had like way more than everybody else. So sometimes the poor people on the adjoining land would be like, you know what, I'm just gonna pop in there and like steal a couple horses and maybe they won't notice that they're gone. You know what I mean? So sometimes they would like steal the horses and like give and like sell them back to the people. Like, but hey, I found your horse. Like, do you have a reward for it or something like that? Or sometimes they would just sell them and or keep them or whatever. But so there was kind of like a lot of that going on, like them stealing horses from like the rich people. So, you know, and they're pretty sure that Ellen's uh, parents th th with their land were doing some shit like that. Now, uh, in 1869, when Ned Kelly was about 14 years old, he met a guy named Harry Power, which wasn't his real name. His real name was actually Henry Johnson. Now, this guy was also Irish, and he was another convict uh, that had been sent to Australia. 
And Harry Power had turned to bush ranging, which, like I said, just basically living out in the bush and being an outlaw. So you're basically stealing horses and cattle and just scraping by however you can, like as a criminal, essentially. Living off the land. Yeah, pretty much. Taking other people's shit. Yeah. I mean, that's that's what they're doing. Um, Now, he had actually escaped from uh, a prison in Melbourne and was bush ranging. Now, when Ned Kelly met him, uh, because the Kelly family kind of knew of him because a lot of these bush rangers, among the poor, they had a lot of sympathizers because, like I said, it was kind of like the poor against the rich in the area, right? So if you were an outlaw, as long as you didn't, like, steal the poor people shit, which you couldn't really because they didn't really have much of anything, but... So a lot of times, um, you know, a lot of the people like the selector families and stuff like that would sort of like cover for you. You know what I mean? Or they would like help you out or give you a place to stay or something like that. So they they had like a lot of which you'll see later, like Ned Kelly. That's why he was able to evade authorities for so long as well, because, you know, people that were that, that did this kind of thing that were Bush Rangers and stuff had like a lot of sympathizers in the area that would help them out and like hide them and stuff. So, uh, so the Kelly family was sympathizers for Harry Power. So Ned Kelly starts hanging out with Harry Power and becoming essentially like his protege. Protege, like he's showing him how to do like bush ranging. This is how you be an outlaw, like out in the fucking, out in the wilds of Australia. So what they decided to do, the first kind of thing they decided to do, was there was a kind of a wealthy merchant named John Rowe, and they said, okay, well, we're going to go and, like, steal some horses from his land, and then we're going to go, like, rob this, I guess, like, some shipment of gold was coming in there, and they were going to do that. But uh, apparently, when the, this was kind of like this, the first one that Ned Kelly was on, and he was only 14 years old, so give him, cut him some flack, but so they go to do the thing, and, like, the John Rowe, like, started shooting at them, in which case they had to, like, run away and sort of, like, abandon the plan. And then I guess that Ned Kelly and um, Harry Power, like, kind of got in a fight about it and, like, were, you know, a little bit at odds for a little while. Now, the first time, though, that Ned Kelly got arrested or came to the attention of law enforcement was uh, in October of 1869. He was 14 or 15 years old. And apparently there was a fight between, oh, hey, Pook. She's like, what am I doing on the show? <laughs> She's wrestling in a minute ago. You wrestling? Yeah. Oh, look at that cute baby. She's yeah. like, pff, pff, pff. I'm wrestling. But yeah, so Ned Kelly's 14 or 15 years old, and he gets into a fight with a guy uh, who was a Chinese pig and fowl dealer whose name was Ah Fook. Now, Fook says that he was just walking by the Kelly house, minding his own business, and then Ned pops out and says, hey, bitch, I'm a bush ranger. He says he didn't say that exactly, but says, I'm a bush ranger, and then swung a stick at him and then robbed him of 10 shillings. That was Fook's story. Ned Kelly said, no, what happened was that Fook came up, asked for some water, and then started abusing, quote unquote, his sister, Annie, um, because, you know, Ned had a bunch of sisters, and then, um, so they got in a fight, like, Ned jumped in there to defend his sister, and then Fook, that st- like, started beating Ned with a stick, and then he, like, was defending himself. I don't buy it. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what, so they, well, this is something that we'll see, like, a lot this of times. It's like a serial behavior from him. Like, they're all, they're all, he's a cry bully. He's a, <laughs> he's, a, he's a cry bully. He's a cry bully. Yeah. He does kind of seem like that. He's he does kind of seem like a little. And I'm not saying that the police weren't picking on him because I think yeah. they absolutely were, but he was a little bit like that too. I think yeah. he was a little bit of like a fantasist where he yeah. was just kind of like it wasn't me, like because he seemed like he was never to blame for anything. He knew how to lie. It was that kind of thing. Yeah. But um, anyway, he did have like his sister testified and a couple of other people testified like on Ned Kelly's behalf, so they did end up like dismissing the charges. So then Ned gets back, hooks back up with uh, Harry Power and uh, in like spring of 1870. And so for the, that month, they start doing like all of these armed robberies, right? And so the cops are obviously like looking for them and they know that Harry, pa- they know who Harry Power is, but they know that he has like this new young kid that's like hanging out with them like his accomplice. So they're trying to figure out who the fuck that is. Now, the press found out who it was and named him. 
And so Ned got captured by the cops like a few days after that, like after his name was reported in the papers. So Kelly gets brought, gets dragged in on three separate robbery charges. Now, the first two charges were dismissed because no none of the victims could um, identify him like positively. They weren't sure it was him. Now, on the third charge, though, the victims also didn't identify him. But what ended up happening was that there was two superintendents who were like kind of overseeing the case. And they said they didn't even let the witnesses allegedly see Ned Kelly. They just said, hey, that guy fits the description. Uh, send him to trial. So there was that. So like I said, I'm saying that I'm not saying that Ned Kelly was necessarily like a hero because he did like some really fucked up shit and like he murdered a bunch of people. But I don't think the cops are blameless in this either because they were absolutely corrupt. And I think that they were actually I think they they kind of finagled things to their own advantage as well and like did things to fuck him over. So I think this like everyone's kind of shitty on, on all sides in this situation. So, yeah, basically they didn't even like let the witnesses see him. They just said, yep, he fits the description. Like we're going to like send him to trial. So they sent him to Melbourne, and then he was in uh, a lockup, and then he went to um, to another place, like to to go in front of the court. They didn't produce any evidence, though. But he was there for a month because back then, um, I guess they could just arrest you and they could hold you for however long. You know what I mean? I, they didn't have a thing where, because I know like nowadays, you know, they can arrest you, but they can hold you, only hold you for however, like f what is it, forty eight hours? 72 hours? I don't remember. I don't know the laws. But um, something like that. But they can't, like, just hold you indefinitely until they figure out. You know what I found out the other day? This is just apropos of nothing, but I was, like, watching some some other, like, true crime thing. Apparently in Japan, and if anybody knows, like, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think in Japan they can arrest you and hold you without charge for 23 days? It's 30 days, much. something like that. Still not much. I know, but I mean, yeah. still, like, without even charging you. Yeah. I, like, they, you know. I've seen um, documentaries on Western guys that went to prison in Japan, and they say they say the time there is so fucking easy, it's not even funny. They say what, what makes time, doing time difficult in Japan is the boredom. They're into repetition and silence, and you got to be quiet, you got to... And they said it'd fucking drive you crazy. But, you know, other than that, it's not like fucking being locked up out in fucking Southern California. <laughs> you know what I mean? Fucking, they don't really have what me and Grampers would call real criminals. They don't really have that in Japan. I don't know. I was watching a thing the other day. There's, there's a channel called Lazy Masquerade. And he's a British guy, I think, but he's lived in Japan for a really long yeah. time. So he'll cover, like, a lot of Japanese cases and they have some fucked up murders happening over there yeah, holy shit what i'm talking about is the toughest thing they have and they don't have gangs to speak of other than the yakuza the yakuza would fuck them up those dudes are nothing okay uh there, and there would be nothing compared to the mexican mob or ms-13 they're, they're they're nowhere near that hard they're soft and you look at them they're not they don't even have physical power so they're not really the kind of guys that if you got locked up with them, that they'd be a problem. If I got locked up with those dudes, they'd be my bitches. I'd fucking, no, I'd fuck them up. No physical strength. They hire foreigners to be their torpedoes. They're just, they're just not tough. They're, they have a fucking hell of a reputation, but that's, that's movies. And I've written, I've read whole books about the Yakuza and fucking sp what they called speed tribes, which means kind of like, uh... Japanese subcultures, you know. Um, and no, the Yakuza are nothing, nothing compared to what you'd find here in the United States or Mexico or Central America. Nah. Soft. All right, so where was I? Okay, so he actually got uh, released on that third charge as well, even though it seems like, allegedly, that maybe the cops were kind of trying to railroad him a little bit, but I'm not really sure. I'm not saying he didn't do a lot of the shit, because he did. Yeah. I'm just saying that, you know, the cops were not really... Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I kind of feel like they did frame him on a couple of things or didn't, like, extend the same rights to him that they would have to other people, maybe. But not not saying that he didn't do a lot of criminal shit, because he did. 
So then in October of 1870, there's this guy named Jeremiah McCormick. And he actually made an accusation against a friend of the Kelly family, whose name was Ben Gould, of stealing his horse. And then after that, this was like a weird, <laughs> this was a weird incident. So then Gould, the alleged horse thief, wrote like an, an indecent note. So I guess so like some porny shit to McCormick's wife. He takes the note. And he wraps it around two cow testicles, like calves yeah. testicles, right? And then he wants to, and then he gives it to Ned Kelly and says, hey, give this to McCormick's wife. This is how the story goes. This is a very weird, like, way to go around things. So Ned Kelly's like, okay, fine. And then he gives it to another one of his cousins to give to her. McCormick comes up to Ned Kelly and said, hey, what was the deal with, like, the Cavs balls and the dirty note that, that y'all gave to my wife? Ned Kelly punched him in the face, and then McCormick fell down. So Ned gets arrested, not only for his part in sending this letter with the Cavs testicles, which, okay, which it went through, like, three or four different hands, apparently. Um, and he also got uh, arrested or charged for punching McCormick. So he got three months hard labor on each charge. So he actually ended up serving six months hard labor uh, for that little, that little incident. Now, after he was released, uh, Ned Kelly got in trouble again, sentenced to three years imprisonment for receiving a horse, knowing it to have been stolen. Although later on, he said he didn't know that it was stolen. He had like a whole story. Like I said, he had a whole story about kind of everything... Which maybe, maybe this was the case. Because I feel like there was a situation where somebody had a horse. Hey, here's a horse. And he just like took it and rode it. And it ended up being stolen. And he said he didn't know. But I don't know. So the cops didn't buy it. So he got three years for that. So he got out of prison in 1874. Uh, his mom had remarried a guy named George King, who was his uh, stepfather. Now, he tried to go straight to his credit. Like, he started working, like, he worked in timber. He worked at a sawmill and, like, worked for a builder and shit like that. Um, but I guess the allure of crime was just, like, too much. Like, he tried, he went straight for, like, three years, like, two or three years. But in 1877, his stepfather, George King, uh, had a horse-stealing operation, and Ned Kelly started working on that. So Kelly later said that they had stolen probably about 280 horses. Another warrant for his arrest came down uh, in relation to one particular uh, horse thievery incident, which is called the Witty Larceny. And that was when they stole 11 horses from this wealthy merchant named James Witty. And so he got an arrest warrant out for that. Uh, it was him and his younger brother, Dan, who I believe was only a teenager at the time. Um, the stepfather, though, he fucking, he took off. They, they never knew what became of him. He was just like, yeah, I'm out. You sons... You just, you take the heat. Now, the next thing that happened, one of the most famous incidents in the Ned Kelly saga, I guess, was the so-called Fitzpatrick incident. So April 15th of 1874, I believe it was. So a police trooper named Fitzpatrick goes to the home of Ellen Kelly, who is, uh, you know, who is Ned Kelly's mom. Now, he was going there because he'd heard that Dan, the younger brother, who also had an arrest warrant out for the horse thievery, was at the house. So he was going to go and, like, apprehend him, like, arrest him. Now, Fitzpatrick said that Ned Kelly shot him and Ned said he wasn't there. So there's two very different uh, versions of this story and nobody knows exactly what the truth of the matter was. This is Fitzpatrick's version. Fitzpatrick said, I got to the house, uh, Dan wasn't home, so he said that he just hung out there for like an hour talking with Ellen, who was Kelly's mom. He said there was a couple other, like three kids there too, because like I said, she had younger kids also. Now, he said that he's like, I heard somebody chopping wood outside, so he goes outside to see that the that this was licensed chopping. And I was like, you had to be licensed to chop wood? I guess you did. So he goes out there to see if this was, li if this was licensed chopping. 
So he goes out and the guy that was chopping was a neighbor of theirs named Bricky Williamson. And he said, I don't need a license because this is my land and I'm chopping wood on my land. So what the fuck? So Fitzpatrick is outside. Now, while he's outside, he says he sees two guys on horses coming toward the Kelly homestead. And he said that these two men were Dan Kelly, who was, you know, Ned's younger brother, who was the guy he had come to arrest, and his brother-in-law, whose name was Bill Skillian. So Fitzpatrick goes back to the house and says, I'm going to arrest you, Dan. Dan said, well, can I at least have dinner before we go? Fitzpatrick said, sure. And he just stood there and, like, watched the dude eat. Then Fitzpatrick said, Ned Kelly comes busting in the house and shot at Fitzpatrick with his revolver. But he missed the first time. Ellen Kelly, the mom, then hits Fitzpatrick over the head with a fire shovel, which, you know. Uh, so there's like a big struggle. Ned fired two more shots and he actually got Fitzpatrick in the wrist, uh, and wounded him during this struggle. Uh, two of the other guys entered the room. They both had revolvers. Dan Kelly got Fitzpatrick's gun. Ned then says to Fitzpatrick, Hey, I wouldn't have shot at you if I'd known it was you. Fitzpatrick fainted, which Ned Kelly thought was kind of funny and can he, you mention on what kind of firearms we're talking about here no okay not that i not okay. that i remember uh so he faints and then when he came back to ned says uh you need to take that bullet out <laughs> with the knife like out of your own arm like you just pry that out of there uh so mrs kelly like they do that and then like mrs kelly put the dressing on the wound or whatever well made a, may, maybe it wasn't deep well, it, no, it probably yeah, yeah. wasn't. I just thought that was and like it might kind of have funny been a that... lead fragment, not so much a bullet, but yeah, okay. <laughs> if you ever shoot cap and ball or black powder, the projectiles were big. They were soft lead, lot, you know, unless they put a bunch of animody in it. But they were usually soft lead, and uh, when they hit, they splattered. <clears throat> you didn't have to hit the target a lot of times. Like I remember, I'd shoot at lizards, and you could shoot below the lizard and still get the lizard. The lead splatters would get them. Uh, with black powder that's when i was a kid of course I, I had a different childhood than a lot of y'all but fucking <laughs> um so yeah that's probably what they're talking about um lead splatters and fucking lead fragments inside somebody were those old-fashioned 1800s fucking black powder firearms deadly yes they were it's just that the method of how it killed you was very different from a modern bullet it was a lower Velocity projectile, very soft, very heavy, um, large caliber, and uh, in some cases the wounds were worse. You know, that's why they were amputating whole arms and legs in the Civil War, or in the war between the states here in the United States. If you got hit in the arm, a lot of times that arm had to go, especially if it hit bone. But they didn't. It wasn't about penetration. Nowadays, a lot of that shit just go right through you. So that's probably what they're talking about. Okay, go ahead. Uh, yeah. So, all right, where was I? All I right, know. so, um, so yeah, Ellen Kelly. I didn't Kelly, mean to distract you. I'm just yeah. looking, trying to color the color it and fucking give it some flavor. That's probably what happened. Okay. What? Yeah. What? She went. Brr. She went. Brr. She's talking. What are you, you have what are you, talk, what are you talking about? Yeah. Okay. Pay attention to me. She's trying to get on the show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so Mrs. Kelly uh, dressed the wound, like, on his wrist. Ned, apparently then, and like I said, this is still Fitzpatrick's version of events. Uh, the Kelly family have a completely different yeah. version of events, which I'll get into in a moment. So Ned apparently says, uh, he came up with some cover story, and he says to Fitzpatrick, if you tell the cops this, then, you know, I'll do something not good for you, or I won't, like, fuck you up or whatever. Uh, and his mom says... If you tell anybody what really happened, then uh, your life will be no good to you. That's what she said, allegedly. Uh, and then they let Fitzpatrick leave. He says he rode about a mile away, and then he turned around and saw two horsemen following him. But he spurred his horse faster and actually ended up getting to, um, getting to like, an inn. His wound got rebandaged, and then he went on to uh, report it to his superiors. So that's what Fitzpatrick said happened. Now, the Kelly family version of the story goes like this. Ned Kelly says, uh, I only just found out about this, like, right before my trial because I wasn't even there. Like, I wasn't, he said, I was 200 miles away. 
Um, and he said, I only heard the shit secondhand. He says his mom, like when Fitzpatrick got there to arrest Dan, the mom asked Fitzpatrick, hey, you have a warrant. Fitzpatrick said, I only have a telegram. And then his mom says, well, then Dan doesn't need to go with you. Fitzpatrick then apparently pulled out a revolver and aimed it at the mom and says, I'll blow your brains out if you interfere. His mom apparently said, you'd not be so handy with that pop gun of yours if Ned were here. Then Dan, the younger brother, uh, even though Ned apparently wasn't there, says there's Ned coming along by the side of the house, like trying to trick him. So then Fitzpatrick apparently goes over to the window, um, like looking for him. And then Dan cornered him, took the revolver and released Fitzpatrick unharmed. They said the wound on his wrist, he maybe got that from like tripping and falling over some shit, but nobody shot him because Ned was not there. Interestingly, many years later in 1879, Ned's sister, Kate, who was only 14 years old at the time of this incident, she said that, Ke that Ned Kelly was there, but that, sh that he only shot Fitzpatrick after the cop had, like, made a sexual advance toward her. She was 14 years old. Now, Ned Kelly denies this. He's like, that's a silly story. That wouldn't have happened. Uh, he says, if, if he or any other policeman, this is a quote, if he or any other policeman tried to take liberties with my sister... Victoria would not hold him. That's what he said. So I would have, like, fucked him up. I wouldn't just let him go. Um, yeah, so there's also, like, a couple other versions where Fitzpatrick was drunk when he showed up and that he pulled uh, the 14-year-old girl onto his lap, like, trying to, like, molest her and stuff. And uh, then there was, like, a struggle. Fitzpatrick pulled out his gun, and then Ned came up, and they fought with him and shit like that. Uh, but nobody... They said they didn't shoot him. Fitzpatrick said Ned shot him, Ned at first said he wasn't there, but and that he didn't shoot him. Like, if he had a wound on his wrist, it must have been from something else. Now, later on, though, three police officers gave sworn evidence that Kelly, after he was captured, admitted that he had shot Fitzpatrick, although he was trying to paint it more as though it was, like, self-defense or something like that, um, not just coming in and shooting him or whatever. So nobody really knows, like, what really happened at that, because they both have, like, wildly different fucking, uh, wildly different stories about that. Wherever this guy goes, there's wildly different stories. That's well, yeah. <laughs> makes me <laughs> makes me think that the boy knew how to spin a narrative. Uh, I think he definitely did. I think he definitely did. Yeah. Um, like I said, I'm not. I'm Wherever not... I go, there isn't a narrative. There isn't three or four other stories. There's one story. If there's three or four different stories, wherever a motherfucker goes, he's a real good storyteller. The motherfucker's a liar. Yeah, some, he's spinning somebody's a tail. fabricating. Of course, he's fabricating, of course. Well, he seemed to have... I mean, everything was very self-serving. And like I said, yeah. I'm not... I get where he's coming from. Like, I get, like, the whole context of, like, how he grew up. I get that there was, like, a lot of resentment. Not just him, like, a lot of people in the area. And there's a reason why um, he became a folk hero and why he had so many people who were in the same situation as him uh, that were willing to hide him from the police and, like, shit like that. Yeah. So, so I'm not, like... I don't know. I, so I'm not, like, excusing shit he did because it was, like, bad, but I can see, like, where the, where, uh, the folk hero yeah. status comes from. Let Absolutely. me address John. He said something. He said, look, he said the Yakuza are very fucking connected with business and politics. The Japanese have a different perspective on organized crime. Yes, I would say so, yeah. I'm not disrespecting the Yakuza. The Yakuza evolved in their own universe. They are doing what they do in that place there. What I meant to say or what I wanted to what I wanted to make clear was is that if the Yakuza or the Yakuza, I mean that's that's the accent. If you were to put them here in the United States and put them head to head with the Mexican mob they'd be annihilated. Okay. They are a Japanese phenomenon. Uh, they, they are specialized for that area. Mostly what they do is collect gambling debts on gamblers. Gambling is not an issue here in the United States. Okay. There's not a lot of money in that. Here in the United States, everything is about the drug trade. And when you're involved in the drug trade, man, the Mexican mob, they even displaced the Italian mob. And when you see the videos that 
friends of mine in Mexico sent me what they do to fucking dudes over there, like cutting their faces off alive while they're pumping adrenaline and blood into them to keep them as alive as possible for so they can be awake for that shit after they've cut their tongues out and stuff. I got it right here in my... I'll show you if you want. I can't watch that kind of shit. You know what I mean? The Yakuza could never do that. They are operating inside a, a civilization. And organized crime always has has to fucking take place within a civilization. But the Mexican mob is taking place inside of a fucking Aztec-style Mexican civilization that has a very bigger threshold, you know? They are intimidating one another and the government. It's just a whole nother fucking game. The, Yaku the Yakuza are more like a... more like a symbiote that has fucking at attached to something. It's not so much of a fucking... of, of, a, pe of a predator, you know? It's a very different situation. To me, all that shit's cutting edge, fucking isometric, asymmetric warfare. It's the intelligence agencies are involved in it, and all kinds of fucking money. I don't want to say anymore. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. That's all I'm gonna say. Why are you afraid you're gonna? Get uh, in yeah, trouble? I don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> I don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> I've been drinking. I don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> trouble with who? The, the, the Just Yakuza? anybody. The motherfuckers might come for me. I don't know, man. Fucking. But no, I mean, I can go to Japan and hang out with the Yakuza. No, no problem. I can go to Mexico and hang out with them. Okay. Wouldn't be a problem. You were to put the Mexican mobs, MS-13, which is more Nicaraguan, El Salvador area. But they, they're up here, too. But <clears throat> No, man. Fucking South, Cent Central American fucking drug cartels would fucking annihilate the fucking Yakuza. They're just a lot more vicious and skilled. But when you talk about brains and brawn mixed together and training and fucking discipline, I hand that to the, to the Russian mafia. Those guys are great. I mean, they got chemists involved in there. They can make vodka turn blue and then they would call that window washer fluid and send that through customs as washer fluid and then turn it clear again and relabel it as vodka and sell that as vodka without having to pay well the that's not that crazy i had i had they a did shit like that when i was a kid i had a chemistry set that would yeah. do that it wasn't yeah. blue it was red you could turn right. it from clear to red in the back of yeah the yeah so that's the kind of shit you're dealing with, with that's the pretty basic chemistry yeah but the Russians have a, a paramilitary and a military background, and those motherfuckers have degrees and um, uh, money and the ability to fucking move through society undetected. And, yeah, the Russians are real good. Real good. But when it comes to fucking absolute bloodthirstiness, the Mexicans. Yeah. All right, so after the Fitzpatrick incident, where allegedly a cop was shot in the wrist, maybe, uh, Dan, the younger brother, he goes into hiding. Uh, and Ned was kind of like uh, not there as well. Now, interestingly, Mrs. Kelly, Ellen, the mom, and her son-in-law, whose name was William Skillian or Bill Skillian, and a neighbor of theirs, William Williamson, they all got arrested and charged with aiding and abetting the attempted murder of Fitzpatrick. Now, they all got tried and convicted. Now, the judge sentenced Ellen, the mom, to hard labor for three years, even though she had a three-day-old baby. Mm. Uh, the two men got six years hard labor. Now, even at the time, and even among people who didn't particularly like the Kellys, they were like, bro, three fucking years of hard labor for a woman who has, like, literally a newborn baby yeah that's a little much and we don't know if she actually yes according to fitzpatrick she hit him in the head with a shovel but we don't know if that actually happened or if that was just fitzpatrick it's, it just seems harsh is what i'm saying three years hard labor i don't know so after that um there were rewards issued for the apprehension of ned and dan kelly these rewards for, were, in back then money, 100 pounds per head. 
Now, I'm not sure if I did the, cause I was trying to do like the money conversions. Like how much money would that be nowadays? But the problem about it is that back then, obviously, because Australia still used pounds sterling, and now they use Australian dollars, which are two different currencies. So I'm not really sure. What I did was I put the money in pounds sterling, like what was 100 pounds pounds sterling like in 1874 or whatever, and what is 100, how much is that now? And then converted that to Australian dollars. So I'm not really sure if this is correct, but it's probably in the ballpark. So the rewards of 100 pounds back then per head, 100,000 or 100 pounds back then would be about 13,000 British pounds today, which 13,000 British pounds today would be the equivalent of 23,000 Australian dollars. So that was like per, so that was like a, a, a phenomenal amount of money. I mean, it's a big amount of money now, but it was a phenomenal amount of money back then. So that was, uh, that was the reward that was offered. So the two brothers went into hiding uh, in the Wombat Ranges, which I love that. Now, this was where they also had a couple guys that were helping them out. Like one guy was named Joe Byrne and another guy named Steve Hart, who were kind of like part of the Kelly gang, right? Now, apparently, uh, I'm not sure how true this is, but a couple of the documentaries I saw pointed out that after Ellen Kelly, the mom, got taken away, if you remember, she had um, some daughters that were all like pretty young, like, so, like under, like tween and under. And apparently these girls were just kind of like left on their own to sort of like fend, uh, you know, they and uh, they kind of didn't have any food or anything. They had like, you know, a house and some land and stuff, but I think they had maybe one cow and like one horse or something. And according to this documentary, they said they weren't really sure, but they thought maybe the cops were thinking, oh, well, maybe Ned and Dan will come back like at, at night to like help their sisters out. And so they started doing shit like poisoning their water, like, and stuff like that. And so like the horse and the cow end up dying and all this other kind of shit. So I don't know if that's true or not, but that was something that I heard on one of the documentaries. But in any case, they took their mom away. And like I said, these girls were, you know, like teenagers and under. There was, I think there was five of them. So yeah, that's kind of fucked up. So after that, you had a bunch of cops, uh, Sergeant Kennedy and constables, Lonigan, Scanlon, and McIntyre. And they go out in October of that year trying to find Ned and Dan. So they camped at this place called Stringy Bark Creek. Now, Ned knew they were there. I don't know if he actually saw them, like, walking around, or if he just, like, saw tracks and figured that, oh, it's cops that are, like, come, come in here looking for me. But he knew they were there. So the following day... Kennedy and Scanlon, they go out patrolling and they leave Lonigan and McIntyre back at the camp. Now the Kelly gang jumps out at the camp and like surprised him. <coughs> Bless you. I know, it's terrible. Lonigan pulls his gun out and Ned shot him dead. So that's, you know, that's one cop dead. McIntyre, uh, knowing this is not going to go well, he surrendered to them. Now, Kennedy and Scanlon, who had been out on patrol, they came back to the camp. Uh, apparently, Ned, and the, or the Kelly gang, asked him to surrender, asked them to surrender, and they didn't. So there was a gunfight. Now, in the ensuing gunfight, Ned killed Scanlon and also shot Kennedy. Uh, it was a mortal wound. So he went over there later and said he just shot him right in the heart to uh, put him out of his misery, essentially. Now, there was, interestingly, this one documentary I saw, because I kind of feel like Ned was sort of trying to paint this as, like, self-defense. Like, they pulled guns on me, and it's just like, you know, I was going to kill them, or they were going to kill me, or whatever. Um, so, they had a guy who was Kennedy's grandson, and he was a, he's a cop, too. And he's like, look, um, I don't buy the whole self-defense thing because for one thing, Ned, after my grandfather was dead, he took his uh, pocket watch. And the pocket watch, he's like, so that's pretty fucked up. Like, you don't kill somebody in self-defense and then, like, steal shit off their dead body. That's like, you know what I mean? So he's like, I kind of think he killed him in cold blood. Interestingly, that pocket watch 
was in the Kelly family because their descendants are a lot of their descendants are still alive. Um, so that pocket watch was in the Kelly family for a long time, and many years later, like descendants of the Kellys, like gave the pocket watch back to the Kennedy family. Hey, sorry, our ancestors sh or our descendants shot your <laughs> shot your descendant <laughs> type of thing, but they're like it's yours, so he gave it back. But I don't know. He said that guy would like seemed like pretty pissed because like hey, the dude killed my grandpa, so I don't think he's a folk hero. You know what I mean? So there was that. So, uh, so yeah. So now he's uh, a cop killer. Many times over. So a little while later, the Victorian government issues a proclamation of outlawry, which I love, offered rewards of 500 pounds for each of the gang alive or dead. 500 pounds uh, back then is equivalent to about 65,000 British pounds today. 65,000 British pounds today is equivalent to 115,000 Australian dollars. Almost so, uh, 170,000 for the American. Something dollar. like that. So for oh, each yeah. of the gang, alive or dead. Yeah. So that was, yeah. So uh, basically, so the cops started to go out looking for him, but they're not doing that good of a job of finding them. Like I said, they did have a lot of sympathizers, so a lot of people were kind of like helping them out. December 9th of that same year, the Kelly gang uh, takes over a sheep station uh, at a place called Faithful's Creek, about four miles outside of a place called Euroa. Now, they locked up 22 people in a storeroom and had one of the gang, uh, Joe Byrne, guarding the captives. And then the other three went into Euroa and then they held up the National Bank. And they ended up getting away with 2,000 pounds, which uh, in British pounds today would be 260,000 British pounds or 460,000 pounds. Australian dollars, uh, got that in notes and gold. After that particular crime, the reward for their capture was doubled. So if you caught these bitches, then, yeah, you'd be set for life, pretty much. Now, interestingly, what the cops did, and this kind of ended up blowing up in their faces, I want to say. January 2nd, 1879, the cops used this thing, which was called the Felons Apprehensions, Apprehension Act. And what they would do is they would say, well, it's also illegal to even be presumed to be a Kelly sympathizer. Like, if you even thought, if you even lived in the same area as them and were just even suspected of, you know, of a whiff of, of, of having helped them or even, like, said hello to them or something like that, then they could absolutely arrest you and could keep you in custody, like, without really charging you for anything. So they decided to use this law, like in the and I'm, and I'm not saying that some of those people hadn't helped him, but they said a lot of the people in that area, yeah, they probably knew the Kelly family because everybody kind of knew each other, but that didn't mean that they necessarily like helped them or were sympathizers or whatever. But the cops were really like cracking down, and they thought that this would help them uh, catch him. So they put out like all these warrants for all these neighbors. Essentially, they arrested 30 guys in the following days, and 23 were kept in custody. Uh, not really clear if these people had actually helped or if he, they just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time or whatever. Um, about a third of them were released within seven weeks due to lack of evidence. But they, there were nine people that um, kind of had, they, they had the thing renewed and they ended up being in custody for like three months. Even though, even in their case, the cops didn't have any evidence either that they had actually helped, helped him out. The cops said, well, the reason that we can't find any evidence is because these people are too scared that the Kellys will do something to them, like, if we, if they, you know, rat on them or whatever. But, you know, I don't know if the police were just saying that or if the people actually didn't. They're like, look, we don't know anything. So it might have been either thing. I mean, it's kind of hard to say. Now, interestingly, uh, this decision, as I said, ended up kind of kind of blowing up in the cops' faces because... It was seen as essentially like a big fucking uh, shitting on people's like civil rights. It's like, look, you're you're sweeping up like all these people who maybe didn't even have anything to do with like helping the Kelly family, and you're keeping them locked up for like all this stuff, like taking all their rights away, and that's fucked up. So it's like even people that didn't even like the Kellys particularly were saying, hey, that's fucked up. So. It ended up really like switching sympathies, but I think this was like a big thing that kind of tipped sympathy more toward the Kelly family and toward the outlaws and kind of away from the police because the police were using these really like draconian tactics 
in order to like catch this outlaw and everybody's like hey you know we just live here on the land and we're just trying to make a living and you're just like arresting people willy-nilly and keeping them them in custody for like months and months when you don't have any evidence that they did anything and that's fucked up so it really kind of blew up in the police officers faces uh saturday February 8th, 1879. The gang strikes again, this time at a place called Gerildery, I think I pronounced that right, uh, which is a town about 30 miles north of the Murray River. They locked up the two cops in the town and took over the police station and uh, stayed there pretty much all weekend. Uh, and they took their uniforms and used the uniforms to go and hold up uh, the bank in the town there too. And got over 2,000 pounds at that one as well uh, in uh, bank notes and coins. They also rounded up 60 people in the, uh, put them all in the hotel, like next door to the bank. Now, when they held up the bank, Ned gives the bank teller this letter that's over 8,000 words. Like it's a, it's a, it's it's a lot. It's a manifesto essentially. Um, now, what this ended up being, because there was a copy of this. I'm not sure if it's the same letter because there's one thing called the Geraldery letter and there's one thing called the Cameron letter. I think it essentially like said the same things. The Geraldery letter, it's, uh, you know, it's online. You can read it. It's 56 written pages. And it's basically Ned Kelly. He had it dictated. I don't know if he could write, but um, he was pretty literate otherwise. But he like dictated it to a friend of his and the guy like wrote it all down. So this 56 page letter, which I read earlier today, is essentially every single crime that he ever committed or was accused of committed, he had a story for, like, why it wasn't entirely his fault. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I know that sounds kind of glib, but that's kind of like... And some of the stuff that he says, like, I could buy it. Like, because he... After he kind of started getting famous, I kind of feel like, yeah, he probably got blamed for some shit he didn't do or there was, like, misunderstandings and stuff, and he was, like, pretty bitter about it, which I get. But, yeah, so this letter... It was kind of like a manifesto, I guess. Not like in a Unabomber kind of sense, but he was basically just like trying to justify his actions and saying like the cops are always like lying to me and the cops are corrupt and it's like, you know, they blame me for shit I didn't do and stuff like that. Like he would say, like I took some like quotes out of the letter. Like one of this is asking for a bicep shout. Hold on one second. They're not fucking that big, dude. They're not that big. I'm still, <laughs> I'm, I'm still in beginning phases, bro. Give me another year. Good. Good. Oh, let me get another get drink. Hold on. How you doing? You all right on that? Yeah, it's okay. obviously okay. it's okay. almost full. Okay. But yeah, some of the quotes that I picked out, like like I said, it's a long letter. It was, well, uh, you know, I, you say 56 pages, not 56 typed pages. It was 56 written pages. So there was only like a paragraph or two like on each page. So it's not as long as you might be thinking, you know. But some of the stuff that I wrote down, and I kind of think that some of the stuff that's in this letter probably contributed also to his sort of like Robin Hood kind of um, kind of persona, maybe. Especially stuff like this. This was something that was in the letter. It says, it will pay government to give those people who are suffering innocence, justice, and liberty. If not, I will be compelled to show some, show some colonial strategium which will open the eyes of not only the Victoria police and inhabitants, but also the whole British army. And no doubt they will acknowledge their hounds were barking at the wrong stump. And that Fitzpatrick will be the cause of greater slaughter to the Union Jack than St. Patrick was to the snakes and toads in Ireland. The Queen of England was as guilty as Baumgarten and Kennedy, Williamson and Skillian of what they were convicted for. So he's basically... That was kind of another ongoing theme in this letter and in a lot of the stuff that he said was that, well, you know, he'd been shit on his whole entire life and he was mad because he saw kind of like cops or, you know, the wealthy like uh, squatters, powerful people getting away with shit, um, worse shit than what he was doing, at least in his mind. And he's like, oh, and I do this little piddling thing and suddenly, like, I'm the worst person ever, but you guys, like, do worse shit than me. I kind of feel like that was sort of, like, the underlying theme of a lot of the stuff. And like I said, he wasn't wrong about some of the shit. Um, and he was probably right about a lot of the police corruption because he wasn't the only person saying that. But it is a little bit... The, the letter is also a little bit kind of, like, justifying everything that he did, which I'm not sure everything that he did was justifiable, but I can understand where he was coming from. 
Um, and Fitzpatrick, the guy that, you know, the, there was that whole incident that where he busted into the house and supposedly like shot him in the wrist or whatever. He says later on in the letter, and this is a quote, I have heard from a trooper that he never knew Fitzpatrick to be one night sober and that he sold his sister to a Chinaman. But he looks at you. I was like, well, okay. Harsh. Hold, hold on one second. What? Fernandez says, give us a bicep shop. I look at Fernandez's fucking, his fucking shot. That's his fucking. Fernandez, you got big fucking biceps too, man. You must be lifting. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm getting big motherfuckers on here on the channel asking to see how big. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. I understand. No, you're looking good. You're looking good, Fernandez. You're looking good. Friend me on Facebook. We'll talk. We'll talk about it. We'll talk about it. See what program you're on. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Sold his sister to a Chinaman, but he looks a young, strapping, rather genteel, more fit to be a starcher to a laundress than a policeman. Again, ouch. For to a keen observer, he has the wrong appearance or a manly heart. The deceit and cowardice is too plain to be seen in the puny, cabbage-hearted looking face. <laughs> now, one of the things that he said, too, was that I'm imagining that in this section of the letter, he's talking about um, the Fitzpatrick incident or maybe something similar. It sounds like that's what he's talking about, because he says Detective Ward and Constable Hayes took out the revolvers and threatened to shoot the girls and children in Mrs. Skillian's absence. The greatest ruffians and murderers, no matter how depraved, would not be guilty of such a cowardly action. And this sort of cruelty and disgraceful and cowardly conduct to my brothers and sisters who had no protection, coupled with the conviction of my mother and those men, certainly made my blood boil, as I don't think there's a man born could have the patience to suffer it as long as I did, or ever allow his blood to get cold while such insults as these were unavenged. And yet in every paper that is printed, I am called the blackest and coldest blooded murderer ever on record. But if I hear any more of it, I will not exactly show them what cold blooded murder is, but wholesale and retail slaughter, something different in shooting three troopers in self-defense. That's referring to the, um, to the thing that happened at the Creek and robbing a bank. I would have been rather hot blooded to throw down my rifle and let them shoot me and my innocent brother they were not satisfied with frightening my sisters night and day and destroying their provisions and lagging my mother and infant and those innocent men, but should follow me and my brother into the wilds where he'd been quietly digging, neither molesting nor interfering with anyone. So he's basically saying, you know, we were just in the woods minding my RM beeswax and these cops came in here and they obviously came in here to kill us. So we weren't just going to lay there and let them kill us. We were going to like fucking fight back. You know what I mean? So, yeah. and they're like, and these cops came in our house and like pointed guns at our mom and our little sisters and shit like that. And that's fucked up. And so what did you expect us to do? Pretty much. That's what he's saying. Um, yeah. So it, it's like that kind of stuff yeah. where, huh? <laughs> what? No, no, no. It's just. There, it's narrative. Go it is. Ahead, I ahead. mean, yeah. And, and like I said, I'm not saying that he's like making shit up, like, but he is a little bit of a fantasist, yeah. I will say. I will say. It's, it's psyops, psychological operation. That's what they're doing. Grafter's Hammer said he talks like Willem Dafoe in the lighthouse. Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I gotta see that one again. What? Yeah, I really like that movie. So, Look, fucking, if you haven't seen the new fucking movie, if you haven't seen um, the new Viking movie, you gotta fucking see it with the Northmen. Uh, yeah. William Defoe is in it. The same director like, br and briefly, everything. Yeah. Same, yeah, the same director and everything. That bitch is fucking badass. Yeah, had Herman Hernandez in there talking about the Mexicans the Mexicans are going back to their Aztec roots. I saw that bitch and I was getting ready to go back to my Aztec roots. I mean, on my fucking uh, Yeah, I was like we you not have a, Aztec roots. Not as my, <laughs> my, my my Viking roots is it's that same fucking thing. Yeah. I was like, oh hell yeah. I gotta see that shit again, man. <laughs> that was a good movie. Real good. That's the new Conan. It's kind of like cross between Conan and Apocalypto. It's a Northern European version of Apocalypto. Another great movie. Fucking Gibson did that fucking movie right, man. Damn. Apocalypto? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. One of the funniest things when you were talking about him, like talking about the dude in the lighthouse. Yeah. But I, this, I had to write this down. He called somebody, Ned Kelly, in his letter. He called somebody, he's like, 
and it's not to be pitied. Also, who has no alternative only to put up with the brutal and cowardly conduct of a parcel of big, ugly, fat-necked, wombat-headed, <laughs> big-bellied, magpie-legged, <laughs> narrow-hipped, splaw-footed sons of Irish bailiffs or English landlords. <laughs> okay, yeah. Which I'm like, that's that's pretty creative. Which is better known as officers of justice or Victorian police, okay. who some call honest gentlemen. Okay. But I would like to know what business an honest man would have in the police. As it is an old saying, it takes a rogue to catch a rogue. Yeah. And a man that knows nothing about roguery would never enter the force. Right. So, yeah, there's that. Also, he said, certainly their wives and children are to be pitied, which kind of made me laugh, yeah. too. But I was like, yeah, that whole fat-necked, wombat-headed Big Bill, I was like, oh, I gotta write that down. That's fucking hilarious. I'm gonna have to, like, say that to somebody <laughs> so if I can remember all of it. But, yeah, um... So, yeah, so that's kind of, like, a very famous letter that he gave to the bank teller, and then, like, later it got preserved, I guess, because it was, like, uh, you know, kind of famous. So, after this situation, uh, the reward for the outlaws was increased to 2,000 pounds a head, and then they brought in aboriginal trackers uh, from Queensland to try and find them. Now, what ends up happening is that one guy who was sort of like a sympathizer, who was like a hanger-on, like with the Kelly gang, I guess. His name was Aaron Sherritt, and he was a friend of Joe Byrne, who was in the Kelly gang. Now, he, unbeknownst to the gang uh, at first, became kind of like a, a stoolie. He was like an agent for the police, like a, like a double agent. Now, uh, when the gang found out about this uh, in 18, June of 1880... Joe Byrne uh, shot the dude dead. He's like, oh, I heard you were, like, working for the police. Blam. So he, like, fucking killed him in his fucking doorway. Uh, so basically what ended up happening was that after this, uh, there were four constables who were supposed to be guarding him. Obviously, they didn't do that good a job because he got fucking killed. They went and hid somewhere. Joe and Dan Kelly, who was Ned's little brother, they joined Ned and Steve Hart. And they go to Glen Rowan. Now, this is kind of where their last stand is. And like I said, there's kind of like a big um, like tourist attraction there too. Like you can see a lot of the sites where the shit happened. So they go to Glen Rowan. They take over this hotel. And they took about 60 hostages. Now, the hostages, you say hostage, but apparently the hostages, they all knew who Ned Kelly was. They're like, oh my God, you're Ned Kelly. You're famous. They're like, can I be your hostage? And apparently they're all just like hung out in the hotel, like drinking and dancing and having a good time and shit. Like he didn't hurt any of the hostages. Some of them did get killed later, but like in the firefight, but he didn't hurt any of them apparently. And some of them were like, just were like, ooh, we're going to party with Ned Kelly. They just thought it was like kind of cool. But yeah, so they're like all hanging out in this hotel. Now, what they had found out was that the, there was going to be this train that was coming on uh, from Melbourne. And I think it had, like, a bunch of cops in it They were because they'd figured out, like, where they were. So they said, okay, well, what we're going to do, uh, the train's coming on Monday, and we're going to wreck it. So they kind of got these two railway workers, and they kind of, like, bribed them or something. It's like, hey, can you kind of, like, fuck up the rails so that the train, like, crashes and then we can like steal all the shit off of the train. Let's do that. So that's what they were gonna do. They kind of had it all set up, but what they didn't know um, was one of the hostages was a guy named Thomas Kerno, and he was a like a school teacher. And he had been in the hotel for a time, but Ned kind of let him and his family leave, and after. T that guy left he went and told um he went to like where the uh the train was gonna be and he warned them hey you know he he was able to get to them and said hey the tr the track is fucked up and you need to like stop so that kind of plan didn't go anywhere and the cops kind of like twigged on to what the fuck was going on and they said okay well there's gonna be like this big thing so at this point ned and the kelly gang they had made this bulletproof homemade armor Ned had some, and, like, I think three of his gang members had it as well. They made it out of, like, this plow, like, you know, like, some plow shit that they'd sold, like, some metal. And as I mentioned, it's kind of like, it was kind of like a, it looks like a bucket, but it kind of had, like, the things, it's just sort of like a suit of armor type of, type of situation, like, from the medieval times. And it had, like, a, um, like, a bib type thing that went over the whole chest and back, and it was very, very heavy. I think it was, like, 90 pounds. Um, yeah, so it had, like, breastplate, backplate, and, like, a whole helmet thing. 
Now, the thing about it, though, was that because they'd been hanging out at this hotel and because I guess they weren't entirely expecting the cops, they thought this like train thing was going to go. So they'd been kind of drinking some. And so maybe their judgment was a little impaired. Um, you know what I mean? And when they put the armor on, uh, it was a little bit awkward because it was very heavy and it was kind of like unwieldy, you know, like to, you know, use guns and stuff like that. So it was just a little bit you know, awkward to like move around in. Uh, also might have like made them feel like they were, uh, you know, like they couldn't be shot, <laughs> you know, even though it didn't cover their arms, I don't think. And it didn't cover their legs. It just kind of went over their front. I don't even think they covered their groin area, which you'd think they... I mean, I've seen pictures of it. It doesn't look like it did. You would think that'd be the first thing they'd think of, but no. Uh, so yeah, so they knew the cops were coming. So they put their they put all their shit on and cop got ready. They're kind of drunk, like I said. So they put on the fucking armor, and a huge firefight uh, begins. So Superintendent Hare, uh, he gets shot in the arm, and because he saw. Like, Ned is, like, coming out through, and he's like, what the fuck is that, like, with the armor? Because he wasn't expecting, like, a big armored dude to come out, right? But the, one of the first things he notices is, like, oh, well, he doesn't have any armor on his legs. So then he started shooting at his legs, which obviously. So, uh, so he hit Ned, actually, in the foot, in the arm, and in one hand. Now, at this point, Dan, the brother, and uh, Joe and Steve, who were the other two guys in the gang... They ran back in the hotel. Ned runs out into, like, the, the bush. Now, the cops keep shooting. Joe, Burn, he gets shot in the thigh. So he had, I, he had uh, armor on, but obviously the armor didn't cover his thigh. So he got shot in the thigh, like, right in the fucking femoral artery. He was standing at the bar, and he uh, bled out. So he died. Now, about 5 in the morning, Ned comes back with his armor still on. And he comes through the mist, like, looking all like a monster and shit. And, again, the cops are like, hey, he's not armored on his legs. So they just start shooting at his legs. Now, most of the people that they had taken in, like, the hostages that were in the hotel, most of those people got out. Um, they either just let them out. They, they weren't, like, trapped in there or anything like that. But they let them get out. The last of them came out about 10 in the morning. Now... A couple of them did get killed, though, in the firefight. There was an old guy named Cherry, and he was inside, like, in a kitchen, and he got shot by the police. Like, they weren't aiming for him. They were just, like, shooting in general. And there was a kid named John Jones, who was the son of the hotel keeper, and he got shot in the abdomen, and he actually died later, like, during the firefight. Now, because Ned had been shot in the legs... Uh, and he couldn't walk anymore, obviously. So the cops actually captured him. Uh, Joe Byrne, member of his gang, again, uh, was, was shot in the thigh and he bled out. So he was dead. Now, Dan and Steve uh, got away. But the cops kept, like, shooting at, into the area and then set the building on fire. Uh, they had a priest uh, after the fire went out. and uh, Or actually, I think while the building was still kind of burning. And he went in there and administered the last rites and said there are three dead bodies inside. They brought out Joe's body, who was, you know, the gang member. Uh, and then the other two bodies they found out later uh, were actually the other two members of the gang. who was Dan Kelly, who was uh, Ned's brother, and Steve Hart, who was the other member of the gang. So they actually had been killed. They thought they had just escaped, but when they went in there, they found uh, their bodies. Uh, what ended up happening was that they had knew that they were going to be captured and didn't want to be taken alive, so they had apparently taken poison. Uh, so, and they were also, and then their bodies were burned up in the fire. Now, uh, so Ned, who was the only surviving member of the gang, he was all fucked up, though, like his legs were all shot up. So they take him to Melbourne, and he gets tried in October of 1880 for the murder of Constable Thomas Lonigan uh, at the Stringy Bark, the Stringy Bark Incident. And I think that was the only thing they charged him with uh, out of all the other, because he had shot a couple more cops too. But um, they just charged him with that, I guess, because they had the most evidence for that. And uh, he got found guilty. And the judge, the same judge, incidentally, who had sentenced his mom to three months hard labor, even though she had a three-day-old baby, uh, sentenced him to death. Even though a lot of people in the um, area were kind of like, no, they were asking for a reprieve, uh, but nope. 
judge was like, nope, fucking hang him. So, uh, yeah, Ned Kelly got hanged. I mean, he killed a cop, so they, they weren't having it. So they did actually, like, hang him in Melbourne uh, on 11th of November, 1880. Yeah. And uh, apparently his last words, I've heard different ones. His last yeah. words were, ah, well, I suppose it has come to this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it did. I guess so. Yeah, I guess it did. Yeah. Uh, oh, well, I guess. It came this to was it. later rendered by a journalist as "such is life." <laughs> that's the one that I've heard more often. Yeah. Because uh, I think it's, it's kind of yeah, the same that's not sentiment. What it was, though. But yeah, I suppose yeah, it's well, come to this. Guess, guess is what it, this is what it's, how it's going to go. <laughs> I guess is how what are you going to go. do? Yeah. <laughs> oh well. What are you going to do? Yeah. So the thing about it. Uh, Strawdog seventy eight. Uh, the speakers are talking about uh, about this. I guess the Aussies love a gallant rogue. Yeah, I kind of feel, and they kind of do in Britain as well. I kind of feel like there's a romantic, uh, you know, a, a, a certain. We do it in the in the U.S. too, especially with, like, with old yeah. West type yeah. figures. Yeah, and a little bit with maybe like mob type figures too. Yeah, not as much, but I kind of feel like if you're not, I don't know, you can be on the wrong side of the law. But depending on what kind of shit you do, like sometimes people just be like, "Yeah, right." He seemed like it. The difference like it. with the American mob scene is that those the old classic gangsters that we talk about only killed other gangsters. I can't think of any of them that killed a cop. Yeah, it's it's, it's other gangsters, and they don't kill civilians. You know, which yeah, and I can yeah. see how. I mean, I'm not saying it's great. I'm not saying that that's somebody you should maybe, like, look up to, but... They're in their own world. They're kind of in their own world. Yeah. Yeah. It's not in the same thing as, like, you know, a fucking serial killer who's just going around and snatching, like, you know, innocent-ass people off the street. American gangsters were in a scene. They all knew that they were gangsters. They had shit to do. They were making a shit ton of money. They had good-looking women and uh, esteem, in a a way. The, The... the media kind of knew who they were, and they only killed each other over shit that was kind of understandable a lot of times. To get killed in the mob, you had to do something that was fucked up. So it so it's kind of a little bit more understandable why those guys were... Um, kind of romanticized. Remo- yeah. Romanticized. They were in the underworld killing each other. And they... Those guys were all volunteers into that world. Yeah. They weren't forced into that world. They were all volunteering. So it's a different game. Were they criminals? Yeah, they were criminals. Yeah. Were they cool? Yeah, they kind of were cool. Yeah, they were cool. Well, I mean, there have been so many movies made about that. Yeah, they were cool. Uh, Would I do it? Depends on the money. I'm a little too old for that now, but if I, can, if I was young and the and the opportunity was right, yeah, you'd do it. I think a lot of guys would. But you're gambling Shit, with your I life. Shit, I probably would if they paid me enough. You're gambling with your life, <laughs> but I gambled with my life in the U.S. Army. You know what I mean? I joined during wartime, that first Gulf War, and I wanted to go. They didn't send me. I went to Korea instead. But everything is a gamble. So I understand... Why American Italian, you know, the Italian American scene, why they did what they did, you know, and even the Mexican mob, I understand quite, you know, what they did, why they're doing certain things. The stakes are higher over there, but uh, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say about it. I'm going to say anything. But yeah, so yeah, yeah Starling yeah, 78 yeah. said, I guess the Aussies love a gallant rogue. It may have to do with their overall attitude towards the government. The US and UK have their fair share of Robin Hood types. Yeah. And I kind of feel like, I think that that might be the main reason why. Ne- so it's like nobody's saying, oh, yay, it's good to like go around killing cops. But the thing about it is that Ned Kelly represented right. for a certain segment of the Australian population then and now is kind of like. Uh, yeah. A man that was kind of like fighting the power a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in the sense, like, I found this one quote by this one writer who says, uh, Ned Kelly is the best known Australian, our only folk hero. Popular instinct has found in Kelly a type of manliness much to be esteemed, to reiterate courage, resolution, yeah. independence, sympathy with the underdog. 
Yeah. So it's kind of like he was basically, yeah, he didn't, he wasn't a good dude, like he was a criminal, but he was kind of like fighting against the institutions that a lot of people back then like saw as corrupt that were shitting on the poor. Yeah. So obviously, like a lot of the poor people were absolutely going to sympathize with him. He's like, yeah, stick it to the man. You know what I mean? I get it. Yeah. I get it. The American perspective was kind of like that, a little bit yeah. different. Um, the American perspective, I would think, would be a lot more like Bonnie and Clyde. Yeah. Where well, Bonnie and Clyde are kind of folk heroes, too. They were fo- yeah. And with Bonnie and Clyde, they liked cops. Uh, they didn't want to fight them. If they were attacked by cops, they counterattacked. They did kill some of them. But they also did what they could not to kill police. There was one guy that they abducted for a while and befriended and then let go later. Um, it, they were mostly against the institutions of the United States, which were the banks and the political parties. Um, but they trained. They did a lot of stuff. I, we got to do a show on Bonnie and Clyde. I can't believe we haven't done we have a no, show about that. Because Bonnie and Clyde... Hand me, hand me a pen. Okay. I got, there's a pen right over there. We're, That's yeah. actually a good yeah. uh, topic. Yeah. I'll put that in the poll later. Bonnie and Clyde is more of the American flavor. And they they liked cops. They saw cops as um, other working class people who were just trying to survive in life. They, they didn't have anything against them. Um, and they did what they could not to hurt them. But they ended up eventually got killed by Frank Hamer and a bunch of other cops. But they knew they knew that eventually they'd be killed. Um, kind of a cool couple in a way. A lot of stuff that never really came out. They were bisexual, both of them, having sex with guys and women. Um, they were kind of like proto 1920s uh, gender fluid. That's what you call it today. That's the way Bonnie and Clyde were. And the cop that they actually abducted because they they kidnapped him instead of killing him. He he uh, gives like testimony in a. Uh, and it ended up in one of one of the old fucking History Channel shows. He said that they were cool people. That he liked them. They were they were outlaws. Um. He thought that fucking Bonnie was quite cute, and that Clyde was uh, an intelligent guy. The the difference back then was is that. Uh, the United States was very corrupt. All right, and uh, the people that were fighting against the system that ended up being kind of criminals were a lot better people than kind of what you'd find today. They were higher IQ. They kind of had a political, kind of a political slant to what they were doing, and they knew how to play the old media of the day. They were good people. I think they were. Were they criminals? Yeah, they were criminals. They were definitely criminals. Uh, they were also murderers. It's just that we... How am I trying... How am I going to explain this? We don't live in a world of black and white. It's... A lot, there's a lot of gray. At the time that they were doing this, the government wasn't good either. Those weren't the good guys either. Well, I kind of feel like that's yeah. what was going on in the Ned Kelly yeah. situation, too. Yeah. So yeah. I think that's why a lot of people, like, why his story, like, resonated right. with him, even though he obviously, like, murdered right. people. Yeah. It was more like warfare. It was closer to warfare than it was crime. This is his, he, and this was his quote, uh, talking about shooting the cops. Yeah. I could not help shooting them. Or else let them shoot me, which they would have done if their bullets had been directed as they intended. Yeah. So he says, shoot yeah. me, so I just shot him back first. It's self defense. Yeah. It's self defense. Right. We got to do a Bonnie and Clyde. Yeah, I wrote it down. Because uh, there's, there's uh, I think the evidence is better that was left behind. There's a lot of Bonnie and Clyde evidence around that is interest, interesting. Um, they're not like a modern criminal, these are old school criminals which were uh, understandable, more understandable, I think, in certain ways. The world was different back then. Um, they, they, 
How do I explain it? I'm trying to get my feelings crossed. The the 1920s was in the United States was a very different time. It was a time of gray, not not so much black and white. And they got caught up in that and they rebelled against it. They killed people, but they also paid with their lives. If you want to go back to fucking uh, Miyamoto, Miyamoto Musashi, who is fucking one of Japan's greatest swordsmen, he, say, he will tell you that you cannot take human life until you're ready to give your own. And that, that's, kind of the, that's kind of the way they were. It was kind of like a suicide pact, what they were doing. But we'll talk about that on, on, on that day. I kind of feel like, uh, yeah. yeah, like you said, these types of criminals, like whether you're in the mob, whether you're Ned right. Kelly, whether you're somebody like that, I kind of feel like they had a knowledge that, you know, they were going into this. They didn't, I don't think they went into it completely blind. They went into no. it knowing, well, that I'm probably going to get executed or I'm going to get yeah. shot by cops one day. It's almost kind of like suicide. Yeah, I, I kind of feel like a lot of them did actually. It was, a kamika- it was, like, it was like a kamikaze thing. They weren't arrogant so arrogant to think that they could get away with this shit and live they were like fuck it see i think that's what and that's kind of one thing that maybe makes them more likable i guess than some criminals like serial killers and shit like that because right right, i kind of feel like a lot of serial killers have a thing where they think they're so much smarter than everybody else like oh well they're never gonna catch me because i'm so much smarter than everybody even though they're clearly not they didn't have yeah yeah they didn't they don't have that that. they yeah they didn't have that arrogance they kind of just were like accepting well this is the life i've chosen so that means i'm probably going to be gunned down in a hail of bullets one day yeah and they were like my time is limited i'll be dead in a, a few months yeah. So uh, we're gonna ha- we're gonna live life. We're gonna live the life that they're denying us. We're gonna live a life of fucking wealth and respect, and we're gonna live a life of fame until we die, which is soon. You know. And yeah, they seem yeah. pretty. They seem they knew pretty about like it. chill about that. Right. Yeah. They kind of they kind of right. knew the knew the score. Yeah. Sess B says Ned Kelly is the most popular tattoo here. Every other guy has one of him. Really. <laughs> yeah, like I said, it's yeah. it's kind of like hard to overstate like how famous like Ned Kelly is in Australia. I mean, it's fucking yeah. huge. Um, yeah, Grandther said uh, the only cops the mob killed were dirty cops. Yeah, yeah. And Stradog seventy eight asked him, "What's the most realistic cop movie or TV show?" Grandther says, "The Wire, without right. a doubt, is the most realistic TV and- show and the most realistic movie." The one with uh, Jake Gyllenhaal in End of Watch. And we'll back up in case people don't know. Granthers and I went to high school together. He is ex-police. I'm ex-military. Um, yeah, and what he said was true. The mob did not want to kill cops. The mob liked cops. They evaded the police, but they had no beef with the police. The police were doing their job, and the mob was doing their job from the point of view of the mob. The mob were the police for the criminals. That's what they were mostly yeah. doing. Right. They, 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 the mob's fight was not with the police. The mob's fight with were other criminals. All right. And when they got caught, they went down, I guess. Sometimes they would rat, depending on what it was. Most of them said, fuck it. it this, these, the, in general... Mob enforcers were underworld cops. They were the police for the gangsters. They weren't in direct conflict with each other. See The Godfather 1 and 2 and you'll understand it. Because there there were some cops that played both sides and paid with their lives. But they knew the the deal too. They knew the deal. Granthers also says heat was pretty accurate. So was to live and die in LA. Oh yeah, I remember that. Worst cop movies as far as accuracy, Lethal Weapon, Dirty Harry, and Beverly Hills Cop. Yeah, 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 yeah. But they were fun movies. I loved all. Yeah, you saying loved, as far as accuracy? Yeah, is. accuracy, no. But fun, yeah. I love Billy Beverly Hills Cop. Billy, Eddie Murphy was one of my, one of my favorite comedians slash actors. I love Eddie Murphy. He's I grew up with him. That's like my big brother. I love Eddie Murphy. Granthers also says being a cop is a sad and lonely and fearful occupation. Yeah. Very few movies capture any of that. Right. 
Blade Runner, maybe. Bad Lieutenant is a cop gone totally off the rails, which yeah. Granther has seen a time or two in real yeah. life. I've honestly, I've been wanting to uh, do a retrospective on Bad Lieutenant, actually, because right. I saw it come up on, it's on Tubi, I think, and I saw it come up the other day, and I was like, oh, I love Bad Lieutenant. We should totally do a fucking review on that. Yeah. But I haven't seen it in a long time. I haven't seen it in a long time. Kevin G says they should make a film about Billy the Kid and Ned Kelly join for, joining forces. I wonder if that sounds like you know what that sounds like. That sounds like a graphic novel that yeah. that probably should have happened if it hasn't happened already. Billy the Kid meets Ned Kelly because yeah. I kind of feel like so somebody please tell me there has to be like a graphic novel series about that. I know that they made like well they made a shit ton of movies about Ned Kelly obviously, yeah. um, and they made a shit ton of movies about Billy the Kid. Actually, there's a new series. That's just called Billy the Kid. I just saw a, a a commercial for it when we were at the theater seeing Firestarter. I don't remember what channel it's on. It's Epics or Hulu. I can't remember. But it's, yeah, there's a new movie about that too. Uh, Rebecca said, not a Kelly fan at all. <laughs> yeah, I kind of feel like, like I said, I know that he's like a big folk hero in Australia, but there's a significant portion of the Australian that just think, well, he's just like a murderer and a cop killer and an outlaw and a criminal and maybe he shouldn't be like lauded and i you know i kind of agree with that i but i can see where he's coming from and i can see why why he became a folk hero yeah i can see that but it's a, but like i said it's kind of the same thing as some figures in like the you know the american west or yeah. you know like mob figures stuff like that where they did a bunch of horrible shit but there's something about them that like well they had captures the public they had imagination character at least sure yeah. sure <laughs> Yeah, Kevin G said one of the earliest feature films made is about Ned Kelly. Yeah, that's I mentioned that like really early on in the show from 1906. I believe it is the world's first feature length uh, traumatic film, and it was about Ned Kelly. Yeah, um, yeah. Sespi says Billy the Kid is loved, but were Bonnie and Clyde, or are they just notorious? Yeah, that's kind of hard to say. I kind of feel like are they folk heroes? What? Well, not to our generation. Not really. Uh, some of the older generations, were they folk heroes? No, they were more like freaks. I would say more like freaks. They were um, a mixed bag of regular people in a weird situation. They were criminals, but they were also understandable at at, at the time. Got to go back and look at the Bonnie and Glide stories. It was a weird couple. You had Clyde, who was... Clyde was a bisexual. But he was a gangster. And, and a fucking thief. And Bonnie was a cute, young waitress that he picked up. And they became kind of like a team to rob banks. And to evade the police, they were what, what we what we would call interstate interstate um, bank robbers. Okay, they would go from one state to the next here in the United States because the interstate laws back then were very different. And they would rob banks and make money, but they gave a lot of it away because they didn't own property. You know, what are you going to do with all that money? And then the media got a hold of them while they were still alive doing all this stuff. Um, they would f fight p local police in small towns. Um, they, ab they had to um, abduct one of them, but they kept him with them for a while. They became friends with him, and they let him go later. It was just a weird situation, and the movies don't really express the whole story sex was an issue um Clyde Barrow was bisexual and he would pick up other guys and women and they'd have this threesomes with and and you had to look at it from the point of view of fucking Bonnie I mean she's a waitress and all of a sudden she's in the in the in 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 the national fucking eye, you know what I mean. In these weird relationships, back in the twenties, having a good time, I guess, you know what I mean. And they didn't live long, though they died. And um, 
part of it was part of fucking Clyde's thing was to take revenge on the prison system because he came out of the prison system the American prison systems where he got raped in prison and they made an attack on a prison from the outside that he was in there was a lot of a lot of weird shit in that story stuff that and a lot of it was sexual which just doesn't really come across in the movies which I think is fascinating that's why I want to do a show on it you know they were strange is the best way I can put well, it. Well, and I it mean, was, I kind of feel like it was, it was, for for criminals to yeah. become something like folk heroes. Yeah. Obviously, you can't like just murder innocent people because that's not gonna. But I yeah. kind of feel like, uh, you know, interstate bank robbers. Yeah. Most people can get behind that because yeah. nobody likes banks, and they're just like, "What? They're insured." Yeah, yeah. You know, and, as long as you like, you know, steal a bunch of shit from a bank and like don't hurt anybody. Then yeah. I think everybody's just going to be like, all right, you go. Yeah, you know Bonnie, I mean? Bonnie and Clyde were not straight up murderers. They weren't. Uh, they were bank robbers. And it was during a time that was uh, uh, weird during the United States. You know what I mean? For, the banks were being blamed for all the poverty. Uh, it was. So politics was involved. I think Jenny's research could probably shed more light on it. But I just kind of. This is all based upon things that I've heard over the years about those times and and that particular couple. It was just an interesting couple. Yeah. And it was kind of a couple where me and Jenny meet him. We probably understand exactly what they were talking about, uh, especially in context of the time that they lived in. They were interesting. And they, they died in a fucking... Hail a gunfire from Frank Hammer and his boys killed him. And I got respect for Frank Hammer too. He was a fucking badass lawman. But he was doing what he had to do. There weren't any good guys or bad guys in this. This isn't a black and white thing. This is uh, gray. All of them were gray. Well, like I said, I kind of feel like that's the same yeah. thing with the Ned Kelly situation. Yeah. Like I said, I don't think he was a good person. Right. Um, but right. I think that he, in his mind, he had justifiable right. reason for the shit that he did. And I don't think that, like, a lot of the cops pursuing him were necessarily good people either. I'm right. just saying that, like, kind of nobody was right. good people on either right. side. It, yeah. I'm going to say that, I'm going to say this, is that when it came to Bonnie and Clyde, I'm not going to say they were good or bad. They were in combat with the United States. They were, like, in a state of war with them. And the, and the United States was at a war with them. They were and the United States was at war with them. So I just can't get moralistic behind it. They just had they had differences that could not be reconciled. Not in those days. What I was saying earlier about like the bank robberies and how like most people would, as long as you don't hurt anybody, everyone's just kind of like, yeah, okay, steal from the banks. Yeah. I kind of feel like that's the reason, and I've put this topic in the poll and it never wins, but that's the reason that I always wanted to do a whole show about the Antwerp uh, Belgium diamond heist. Yeah. Because I read a couple books about that and that yeah. shit was fascinating. Okay. It was a whole gang of jewel thieves. Yeah. And they spent two years. Like, they, like, had somebody hired in the shit, like, as a security guard. They cased the joint, and it was just, like, the way... Because if you don't know, like, Antwerp, Belgium, it, Belgium, it has, like, this diamond district. And yeah. around the district, they have these things, like, underneath the sidewalks that, like, after everything closes for the day, it, like, comes up, like, these big poles, like, made yeah. of concrete and shit. So, yeah. like, you can't get in there. So this gang spent, like, two years, like, figuring out, and they got away with, like, all this stuff. And yeah. as far as I know, I don't think any of them got caught, or maybe, like, only one or two of them did. And they got, like, a billion dollars. They got, like, a ridiculous amount of jewels and, like, money and stuff. Yeah. And, like, I read the book, and at the end, I was just kind of like, you go. 
Yeah. Good for you. You know what I mean? It's just kind of like, I know it's criminal, but, you know. Granther's put, he, he, he said. Granther said, uh, just want to put this out there. Jenny's research is top notch. Thank you. Mad respect from Granther for the work yeah. she puts into these shows. Thank you very much. I mean, it is, it's a little bit harder, like, this, since we moved the show to Wednesday, because I don't have as much time, like, to do as much research as maybe I would like to. But I do try to, like, cram as much of it as I can, like, yeah. into, into a couple of days. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I try to get, and, you know, and I apologize if I get some shit wrong. I really try not to, but... You know, and I try to kind of give a balanced view of things, but I try to like at least read three or four different like, uh, you, know, you know, things of it. I try to watch like, you know, at least two or three different documentaries on the shit and like take notes about that. So, you know, yeah, Seth says on the run and love dying together. It's romantic in a fucked up way. Yeah, it is. Um, you know, can't deny that. Uh, there's this movie Wisdom with Emilio Estevez. I kind of remember that. Was Demi Moore in that too, or am I thinking of something else? Wisdom. Yeah, that was kind of like, yeah, I remember that. Kevin G keeps bringing up uh, Kelly Experiment and Bulletproof Body Armor. Yeah, the, uh, we talked about that earlier. Yeah, he, um, I mean, it worked, but he just didn't have any armor on his legs, though. So that's uh, that's kind of what was his downfall, because they were just kind of like, hey, no armor on the legs. So they just talk but the, you know, the upper half works good, though. So... He, he knew what he was doing. They all had it, like, fucking before. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, like, uh, they even have, like, um, you know, big, like, statues of him in that outfit. But if somebody wore that outfit here, like, if you made that a Halloween costume, I think everyone would just think that you were the Zodiac. Because the shape of the helmet looks like what the Zodiac wore, even though that was cloth. But it was, like, that kind of square thing with, like, the eye slit or the eye holes i don't know it looked like a cross between like the zodiac and like a medieval suit of armor type situation to me camp guy serial killers who committed suicide before police could question them isaac uh keys yep her baumeister leonard lake yep Maury Travis. I don't think we've done a, we've done a show about the those three, but I don't think we've done one on Maury Travis yet. I got to write that down because I don't think we have. We've done like so much stuff. I'm trying to like find new. Well, the thing about it is that we've done like all the main serial killers, but there's still like a fuck ton more out there, which is like really really scary. And there's a couple that I've wanted to do, and we haven't got around to it. Uh, Grant, there's oh, gives me some more recommendations. Recommendations of criminals for future shows. Claude Dallas, Coral Watts, and the Days In Killer. Oh, yeah, okay. I've heard of that sort of... Okay, I'm going to write that. Yeah, down. sounds familiar. Claude Coral Dallas. What you doing, Pogue? I'm going to write all that down. Coral Watts, yeah, I heard about that. And the Days In Killer. Yeah, because I need some more, like, true crime stuff. I mean, not that I'm ever going to run out of serial killers, because <sighs> there's a zillion. So many. But, well, the thing about it is that... <laughs> this is going to be a fucked up thing to say, but... Some serial killers, like, they kill a lot of people, yeah. But I think it makes a more interesting show if they kill a lot of people, but also, like, in a really fucked up way. You know what I mean? Because yeah. sometimes, I don't know, like, sometimes you have a serial killer that kills, like, 30, 40 people, but a lot of the, you know, it, it, I know that's, like, a fucked up thing to say, but sometimes you want, like, the show to be interesting, so I don't want it to just be, like, a litany of... You know, here's 40 victims that were all killed in the exact same way. I know, it's, I know it's a terrible thing to say, but that's kind of that's kind of like what I look at when we're doing like a serial killer. You know, yeah. you don't have like somebody like John Wayne Gacy that dresses up like a clown and shit like that. You gotta have like a weird. You gotta have like a weird aspect to it. How long have we been on? Two hours and 48 minutes. Okay. Two hours and 48. And we're done with the show, right? Yeah, I got through all my yeah, notes, yeah, good, uh, good. actually. Which, okay, yeah. so if you guys have any questions, go ahead and drop them in the fucking comment section that me and Jay will talk about it. If not, then we will check the fuck out here soon. Grandpa hey, said, what? How you doing? On, you want a uh, half a drink? Yeah, give me another, like, half. A half? Okay. Grandpa says, Coral Watts killed between 80 and 100 women in the 70s and 80s, but few know about him. Yeah, it's like I've heard the name, but it's one that doesn't really come up a lot. You know? It's weird because every now and then, like, when I'm looking for new topics, like, to put into the polls, 
I'm always kind of like, what serial killers haven't we covered that are like interesting serial killers? So sometimes you have these like sites will be like, here's 10 fucked up serial killers that you never heard of. And then I'll go to the site and I'm like, I've heard of all of these serial killers. Like, what are you talking about? Serial killers I've never heard of. I'm like, I want one that I really never heard of. (laughs) So it's getting hard. Like I said, it's not hard to find serial killers. There's a lot of those. There's like a whole fucking Wikipedia page. It's just broken up by country and there's like zillions. But, you know, you want one that's going to make like an interesting show. They have to have like some weird shit about them or something like that like just to make it a good show you know i saw i watched a video on youtube earlier today which was i think it was something called serial killers that probably don't exist you know what i mean and that was actually kind of interesting there's about smiley face killers and uh the manchester pusher which we did shows about those which you know nobody's really sure if those are actually serial killers if there's a bunch of weird accidents and uh he was talking about like a bunch of other ones too but yeah that was a good one um grumpish says also the bath michigan bombing which killed 100 children 95 years ago yeah i don't remember that uh the ypsilanti killer the oakland county child killer Uh, that was actually the oakland county child killer i think i just put that in the poll last week but it didn't win like the week last week or the week before yeah because that's another one that uh comes up on a lot of lists that a lot of people don't hear about there's a bombing Ypsilanti killer. Shark attacks. That's what Blairdo dude said. Ooh, that yeah, that'd be good. Shark attacks. That'd be a scary show for making them. Yeah. I'm really scared of sharks. <laughs> Cause I gotta put a po- uh, I gotta put a poll up tomorrow morning. Yeah. So I need some like topics to put right. in there. Cause a lot of times. I don't know. It's getting harder to think of stuff. And it's and I know there's like zillions of topics that we could talk about. It's just that a lot of times I don't really like think I can't really think of them because my brain gets fried after a while, you know? Sess B says, on a side note, Coral is a really shitty name. No wonder he was pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> Coral. Coral. Motherfucker was putting them glass rods up fucking dudes' dicks and fucking crunching them with pliers and shit. The old Dean. No, he's not talking about he's not talking about Dean Coral. Talking about Dean Coral. Wasn't that his name? Yeah, but well, that was his yeah. last name. Okay. They're talking about Coral Watts. Oh, Coral Watts. It was okay. a different guy. Okay. Dean Coral, that was spelled different. Oh, okay. Yeah, that was like some that was fucking yeah. sounding, but yeah. fucked up. Okay. You know what's funny? I was watching what was I watching the other day? It was one of my shows. I think it was Beer and Board Games on YouTube. And uh Matt Sloan on there like brought up something about sounding and nobody yeah, else on yeah. the show knew what that was oh, no, that's and I'm like oh does that mean I'm a freak because I know exactly what that is and I laughed because nobody else knew what it was Jenny and I fucking saw <laughs> saw a video do you guys know what sounding is sounding is when somebody <laughs> takes a damn rod and puts it down dude's dick hole your dick hole yeah and they got guys that are into that and like okay. sometimes you get larger because I used to for a brief yeah. time I used I had an Amazon store where I sold like sex toys yeah, and man. they have sounding kits oh, gets with like larger and larger yeah. like rods because you you know you put a small one down there you put a bigger one bigger one bigger one yeah you know? there was some porn me and Jen came across that would fucking cause my hair to stand straight up when I was fucking seeing it uh, my hair would st- straight up and then I'd fucking dive into that shit I'd be like yeah I don't know what it is it was some kind of weird pain pleasure principles going on and it was fucking a german model her name was fucking penelope black diamond and she oh, yeah, I remember yeah that. she's this little skinny german girl with black got a little gothic german girl with fucking black fucking hair with these huge fucking implants all right this is like the size of black like like the size of basketballs sounding her boyfriend with this fucking stainless steel rod just going down like that and fucking he's videotaping it and my fucking hair is standing up on the fucking back of my neck. I was like, oh no, 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 (laughs) no. And then there's something about it making me want to fuck. I can't understand. (laughs) (laughs) On the other hand, I I really like those ones where like dudes where dudes have to like stick their testicles and dick like through a hole in a box, and then a woman comes along and spike heels and steps on. (laughs) (laughs) Those never fail to like crack me up. I'm just like, look at him, look at him, squish, look at him, squish him. 
<laughs> That's just, like fucking funny. All you gotta do is fucking Google that shit. <laughs> Penelope Black Diamond. <laughs> Spell Penny Lope. Penny Lope Black Diamond. That's how Penelope's spelled. With the fucking, with the fucking you know that, sounding right? shit, and it will fucking, you'll understand exactly what I'm talking about. Jeffy Art says, I work at a fetish shop. I was well schooled in sounding. Yeah. Yeah. I was just surprised. I was yeah. said, I don't know. I guess I just figured everybody kind of knew what that was. Yeah. So I was like really surprised when Matt brought it up on beer and board games and like yeah. the other three people in the show didn't know what that was and so he had to explain it. Everybody's going like, oof. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Yeah, they have the kit. They have like a really nice kit. It comes in like yeah. a big black box and there's like these really pretty like silver rods and they just like get bigger and bigger and bigger. So yeah. like you, you work your way up. Well, it's just kind of like when you have a piercing and you know the gauge and you just like get bigger yeah. and bigger. It's like, you know, people are into it, I guess. There's just something about the fucking pain principle that fucking I don't know I, I, most people I read I read a book not too long ago this yeah. you might find this entertaining but yeah. I read a book not too long ago not not necessarily do a sounding but like weird sexual shit where um and if you guys watch my book reviews you probably know what book I'm talking about but uh there was one point in the end where a dude inserted his entire head into a woman's vagina I don't believe it <laughs> I don't believe it. well it was a book it was a fiction yeah you know what I mean yeah, yeah. So I don't know. Well, like, like they did establish that the woman had like a really cavernous okay. vagina, <laughs> and he had also like kind of gotten her up to. Yeah, he it was an, it was an extreme horror. He yeah, he up. had like larger and larger yeah. dildos for that purpose because okay. he wanted to put his entire head in there. Okay, well we're, at, we're <laughs> okay we're uh, fucking the people seem like they're leaving. We're gonna go ahead and fucking go ahead and shut this down. We will be with back with you guys. When now? Friday. Friday. We'll be back with you Friday. Friday night on Friday our sidetrack show. And I will make... Look, I got all that fucking cobbler done down there. Oh, that's right. Yeah. He made berry cobbler before berry the cobbler. show today. And yeah. we haben't had it. Blackberry yet. cobbler. Sitting there a big old sheet pan of it. All right. We'll have some of that. Okay. That sounds really good. Sounds good, huh? All right. Well, thanks, you guys, for dropping by this evening and hanging out with us. Uh, we will see you again on Friday evening for our sidetrack show. So hopefully you drop by and join us on that. And uh, yeah, so we'll see you guys then. Thanks for dropping by. Thanks for all the super chats. And good night.